Just when you thought there was nothing left for you to do with your night, the Revolver Podcast, Mama Hot Flash, crew is hot, always doing you right, with a fresh take on gaming weekly, PCs, consoles, and handhelds, bump what you heard since birth on this earth, we know that the future belongs to the nerds. Revolve Alive, what you say? Revolve Alive, every Sunday at 6, bringing that gaming magic to your life, doing it live on Twitch to show that you don't want to miss, be sure to subscribe, crack yourself a brew, if it work, are you who, now you can join the crew for the ride. Xbox, mobile, and hot topics around the nation, to gaming rigs, headsets, hardware, and PlayStation, shout out to Joe, can't you see him glow, token brother brought the flow, now it's time for the show, let's go! He sounds like he's he, he knows what's up in this yeah. podcast. Even, um, even you know what, guys? Even when I get this from Gary, it still sounds sultry and nice. He's like right? the white Barry White of the UK. I love it. It sounds so so <laughs> so soothing. Get your shit together, Beastly. I'm like, absolutely, Gary. Absolutely. Some would call him the voice. The mm. voice. <laughs> Discount buy. Anyway, the first <laughs> bit of feedback that we got actually was from friend of the show, Hugo Roon. Hugo! Um, who sent us a delightful email. I see you lurking in chat. Delightful email with some great feedback, um, saying he really likes the idea that we're expanding out not just from games, but also into general nerd culture. Um, and just for James Pratt, Hugo, um, he actually asked us to take a shot of liquor when we changed each topic. So six topics deep, we're going to be six shots deep on Look, this. Look, Hugo, so... like, I'm not going to lie here. All right, this is good feedback, and as soon as I read it, I liked it, except for the fact, Hugo, I got shit to do. <laughs> six shots. When I first heard so... this feedback, I was like, that's really going to mess up the rest of my Sunday night. The last you episode know? of Be- Beastly Thoughts Live, I had five beers, and I don't remember the last half of that show. <laughs> I don't remember the first half of the show, bro. It's so a good thing Mrs. Rabbit the, um, came in and took that one beer from you. Yeah, so. for sure. She sure so did. Kicking the show off in uh, Hugo's honor, we've got, for those of you listening to the audio only version, we've got a Jägermeister poured. Uh, so, Jin Jin, gentlemen, pour out a little for my homies. I think this is going to be something I do on a not regular basis. Like, oh. if I know I ain't got anything to do on Monday and possibly Tuesday. Yeah, I'll do some shots on Revolver. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And for me, guys, I'm not drinking any alcohol, but I do got some purple drink in here. And so I still get street cred for my purple drink. It's actually purple. <laughs> there it's you go. Rib- it's Ribena. Um, so other email that we got was from a gentleman, Super Dan. Uh, so thanks, Super Dan. He actually gave the um, the feedback. Really enjoyed the podcast, but it will be a cool addition to see guests on the podcast every once in a while. What do we think of that, bringing guests into our uh into our little club. Yeah. That is for sure in the plan, right, guys? Yep. Yeah. Definitely. I, think, I, definitely. I think it's definitely in the pipeline probably within the next few weeks. We're going to work something out with some interesting individuals to have them on the Revolver Live podcast. So it's definitely coming. Uh, it's something we talked about, you know, during the, the pre-show and, and coming together with the ideas of Revolver. It's kind of like a revolving chair type of situation on the Revolver podcast. So oh. I'm excited to see that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Like the yeah. revolving chair that could be like yeah. the fifth seat right the revolving yes. chair yeah. yeah i think it's 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 okay to kind of get our legs under us first couple of episodes right and then bring in guests once we're we're familiar with the format ourselves and we can yep. we can help people out uh when they come on the show a little bit let, let me get this laptop fixed it's, <laughs> hey, hey, man. i was looking at some asian porn and i don't know what happened here but looking at us right i'm looking at the, the three of you guys and myself and something that I said on the Revolver uh, soundtrack that acts absolutely rings true, the future is for the nerds. It belongs to us. It's really exciting to see that. The coolest motherfuckers on earth were yesterday's nerds. And look at us now. It's a beautiful right. thing. Literally, the four coolest motherfuckers on earth are in this on this show. I mean, that's how yeah. we got together. There was, there was basically a meeting where they said, okay, we need the top 100 coolest people on earth. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to weed you down to the top four. And, <laughs> you know, us being the co- four coolest people on earth, we knew that we were going to make top four. So we basically started making our plans before they even weeded us down. Yeah, right. yeah. I barely, <laughs> made, I barely I, made number four because I vape. <laughs> I mean, everything's well, accurate. It was the fidget that spinner that got you in, though. I, 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 think Wilson, I think Wilson's super cool because his neighbor is a demonic child named Dennis the Menace. And he calls Wilson Mr. Wilson. 
and Briar is the most expensive, rarest Destiny DLC you'll ever see. You'll never see it, that DLC. It's just Briar by himself. Briar's just pure pay to win. I don't like it. <laughs> so what did we have in the Discord, Wilson? We, uh, I know that you've, uh, we had a ton of feedback in there, and you are the uh, the Discord moderator guru. I, I guess I guess I would I would go by that. Uh, we did going on the uh, topic with more feedback. Um, Omega Ra chimed in and said feedback, five topics, and the sixth one being a dick joke. So <laughs> good, definitely. <laughs> Some carry definitely take that into consideration. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. So is it not so much feedback, but more of a comment on our previous topic of mm -hmm. buying games digitally and game sharing? Yeah. Um, so is it a uh, good friend of the uh, of the stream says uh, buying games digitally is just so more advantageous now. I've got good internet, meaning I can download the game quickly. With game sharing, I can not only save living space, but because no boxes, I can save money by sharing the price with my brother. Plus, games require installing and day one patches now anyway, so you won't get around to it right away. Paying half the price is just an advantage I can't justify buying physical copies for. Plus, yep. I can buy the game with more stuff in it and still save money co compared to buying a physical copy, which which is pretty much what we touched on, so it seems that uh, he agreed on our uh, game-sharing topic there. You know, with, uh, with being able to download it, too, is, like, if you're excited for, like, a midnight launch of a game... A lot of the games yeah. now you can preload, pre so you have it downloaded and ready to go. As opposed, to if you go to the box or go to a store, you know, buy it at midnight, bring it home, then you got to install it, then you got to patch it, and then you can play it. It could be three o'clock in the morning by the time you get around to playing it. Yeah, and uh, Mr. Goodbytes also made a really good point in Discord, saying that buying the game digitally um, basically saved his game because he almost lost it to a scratch disc. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. you scratch your disc and you got to get a new one. You pretty much just got to make sure that you got the storage space when you're working with a uh, digital copy. So seems seems to be the way things are going, man. It yeah, really does. I, a lot of people do, agree. Do you guys think that digital is actually competing with physical or do you think it's possible that it's taken over and surpassed it at this point? Or do you think we have maybe a few years until we get there where people are a majority of gamers are buying digital? It's really hard to find stats on that kind of stuff, basically, because nobody shares their digital sales, right? Mm. Like we get we get the box sales stuff from like MPD and stuff based on yeah. you know what Walmart reports and what you know how many buyers they've had and you know like that like retail outlets, but Sony doesn't like report that stuff. They don't report how many sale how many games of Fortnite they've sold. Uh, Fortnite might might Epic might report that, but you know are they blowing smoke or what? I don't know. What the hell is Fortnite? <laughs> That's a damn good I, question, Beasley. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. That, that's our first topic of the night. And, uh, I put it in the in the um, in the document for the show because it, it it is the most confusing game I've played in a long time. Um, ultimately, it's a fun game, and I think it's worth picking up for what is it forty dollars minimum? You can spend up to a hundred dollars on it uh, right now, and it's in early access, so it's not a cheap game. Um, but this game is a combination of a third-person shooter, a base-building game, um, a crafting game, a looter shooter. Uh, I mean, it's got so many different moving parts in this game that all do combine to be a really fun game with a horrible UI uh, that I, I got to <laughs> tell you guys, I'm actually enjoying the hell out of it. I find myself logging into this thing every day to at least check what my daily rewards are, because you don't even have to play to get daily rewards. You can just log in, check your daily rewards, and log back out. Um, it, there's so many different pieces to this game. I know that Gary and Wilson have both played it. Beastly, you haven't had a chance yet, but I got to say, it's worth checking out for $40, although you do get quite a bit more for the $60 version. <laughs> oh, really? Well, I yeah, mean, you uh, do. Yeah. I think we, we were talking pre-show of uh, doing this for the uh, Revolver game night, playing this mm -hmm. on Tuesday. Is that yeah. something you guys would like to try to do? Yeah. I'd love that. Uh, it's I'd also cross-play between PC and PS4, so it doesn't matter what you play on. You can play with everybody. Gary, we can play together. <laughs> you won't be able so to exciting. see me, man. You're only at 30 frames. I'll be zigzagging across your screen. You don't worry about it. There we go. Uh, yeah, yeah, I had a chance game. to jump in and play the game, and I thought it was a lot of fun. I really enjoy a game with RPG elements. You got like a skill tree that you can spec into that gives you, you know, your basic stuff, attack, health, fortitude, you know, defense, that sort of thing. And then there's also like things that you can spec into for like 
faster building and there's like a bit of a grind to it as well like there's things that you can join up with friends and do daily missions and hmm. if they're hosting i saw people they were like uh tefty was like farming it so he would host it they jump in like do the daily mission and somebody else would host it and they jump back in and like do it again so it was kind of a way to like Double really up. help your friends out yeah and they were you know you get like legendary and epic loot drops and stuff so you've got the the tier system the yeah. white green blue purple gold for all the weapons and stuff and it's it's a lot of fun like i i gotta say i enjoy the rpg slash shooting elements more than i enjoy like building stuff to defend so does it feel like an un, uh, uncharted style game when you play it <clears throat> is it is in that vein of being a third person shooter and also the most important question i have is i've never even seen this in action are is this a pvp or a pve type of game are you PVE going against other... only pve PVE only. only it is third person shooting like like what'd you say last of us i don't even remember i said uncharted. uncharted uncharted i mean it, it doesn't it doesn't have the same it's got a more arcadey and kind of um uh easygoing atmosphere than something like that it's very cartoony yeah. Uh, it's very easy to shoot things. There's a lot of auto aim. There's a lot of bullet magnetism. It's the challenge comes toward the sheer amount of enemies that eventually come toward you, rather than trying to get precision shots. You know what I mean? Right. So yeah. you said there, is it, you said you can kind of build too. Can you build fortresses and stuff like that? It, there's a bunch of different mission types, um, and a lot of them kind of end up with you having to protect a thing. Um, gotcha. some of them, you go into like just one mission and there'll be like a van that you got to protect while they like inflate a balloon. So the van can fly away and you've got to just real quick, put up a fort so that these hordes of zombies that you can't necessarily shoot all at once as, so that w as they're coming and you're trying to kill them, they don't start killing your van. So there's a, a tower defense aspect to that where you want to set up traps, you want to set up, build walls that you could shoot over, you also want to build walls that they have to try and knock through to get to the objective. And then there's another type of mission where you have a persistent base, where you actually, mission after mission, go back to the same area and keep building onto this base that you started. Um, and over time, that base gets more and more elaborate, which is actually really fun. Um, it, it's weird because, I feel like there's like a, something in here for every kind of gamer, right? It sounds like, like it. If you like yeah. Minecraft, there's something in there for you. If yep. you like shooters, like Destiny, like looter shooters, there's something in there for you. Like there's just so much in there. So huh. taking a step back from the game itself um, and something that I guess that I've seen in the chat uh, a couple of times and something that I wanted to touch on, Epic Games are... I guess since they've moved away from um, Gears of War, they've, they've really been a free-to-play developer. That's kind of their bread and butter. Things like Paragon, the new Unreal Tournament. Shadow Complex isn't granted, but the, you know, the Unreal Engine and modding, it's, it's all free-to-play. That's their, their mantra. This is no different. So Fortnite itself is being developed as a free-to-play game. What we're doing is paying for an early access build, um, which I don't know. I don't know how we feel about that because effectively you know that if you spend forty dollars sixty dollars a hundred dollars today in less than 12 months time someone else is going to be paying that uh, so playing that game completely free of charge so how do you feel about paying early access for a game that is inevitably going to be a free game as long as they keep up with the game and it makes the game experience better for the players i have no problem with that if we went into another problem like day z or something mm. you know what i mean like that they sold millions of copies of that and then just like bailed on it. And, you know, there's rumors that it's going into beta later this year, which I'll believe it when I see it. But it's that kind of, I think that game in particular left a lot of bad taste in people's mouth with that. Um, but lately it seems like a lot of people, you know, like uh, PUBG, um, they've been doing a really good job of taking the money that they've earned and making the experience better and delivering it quicker to the gamer. So as long as they do that, I'm okay with it. Yeah, I, uh, Gary, you're the one who kind of brought this game to my attention. On uh, we have like a little uh, Twitter chat that's kind of constantly moving, and uh, so I went and I checked it out. And one of the things I realized was it was made by Epic Games, the same guys who've been making Paragon for forever, and they've been supporting that game really well. So like it kind of made me feel better about buying into early access. Um, their pricing structure is a little 
screwy. Like you can spend upwards of a hundred dollars on this game without much yeah. of a problem. I ended up yeah. going with the sixty dollar version just to get kind of basically a head start, which. I don't know if I'm really happy with that decision because one of my biggest complaints in the early hours of this game was that it was too damn easy. And I suspect a lot of that was because I had bought that early I had bought that $60 version oh, that wow. came with more powerful weapons and I I think it even came with like a better heroes right off the bat. Um so if Lucky I had, if I had started off with absolute zero for loot and like had to start with like the worst of guns then I might have found there's more challenge right at the get-go because I really breezed through uh, the the opening levels of this game. Yeah, I mean, about the base edition. another topic that we haven't touched on as well, which I think is probably a fucking important topic on it, is that ass, man. How thick are the women in that game? This game is bringing <laughs> big ladies. Oh, shit, I'm buying it right now. <laughs> they got, the, they got the, the curves. They definitely they got the, definitely they got got the, the booties. Curves. Yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> but that's the thing that keeps me playing every day, to be honest. I'm not looking at the daily rewards. I'm just looking at that ass. Look at the Pangea, that landmass. Just... Hey, hey, Gary, we might not agree on PC and consoles, but I like to call you my brother. <laughs> I will say... There was... Go ahead, Gary. Go, go ahead, ahead No, go ahead, Brian. Uh, one of the I things guess. that's driving me crazy about this game, and it, it, it still is after... I've probably put about 12 to 16 hours into it at this point, is that the UI of the menu system is overly complex and not oh. very well explained. Um, I hate that. It's it's once you start getting used to it, like you just kind of instinctually know what to do. And once you get used to the fact that, like, you know, some things that seem confusing at first are just basically kind of covers for here's how you you go through your RPG stats, like you know your damage and your HP and your tech abilities. It's all like there's like these covers for things that are unnecessarily complex, right? Um, so as you as you play, you start realizing that this stuff is under there, but it's not really well explained when you get going. And even though there are tutorials, a lot of them are text based. And if you're like me, you get bored of text really quick. <laughs> you know, you start skipping through stuff. So I'm, you know, you're missing stuff. There's like, there's a bar of menus at the top of the screen that you know every one of them's got a fl blinking exclamation point on it, and you're just like, uh, what am I supposed to do next? Hmm. Convoluted menus, they turn me off quick. And I don't like to do a lot of reading playing games either, Briar. It makes me feel like I'm at work. I think they just need to put more pictures in there for you guys. Um, yeah. But I will I will say that uh, I bought the base edition, and so I kind of had it a little bit of a different experience than Briar mm -hmm. did, like, starting out. Um, I will say, like, the first, first mission was pretty easy, but when the first time I had to defend my base by myself... Um, I actually barely made it through that. They almost got through my doors a few times. It's a horde of zombie, like they call it the storm. Oh, they're Possibly. zombies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like a horde mode where uh, I think didn't they call it the storm? Isn't that what they yeah, call it? Yeah, they're, the, they're um, the the creatures are called husks. So the yeah. storm um, effectively created a load of zombies that kind of they wear the humans as like weird like cloaks and skins, yeah. and they're kind of they got them on. It's really cartoony though. I mean, this this sort of game is. While it's a, a zombie horde game, you could easily give it to like an eight, ten year old person and they wouldn't be. Gotcha. It's, it's not violent. Yeah, it's, it's not gory. No. Yeah, it's t Team uh, Fortress kind of looking game more exactly. so than Overwatch. Yeah, and um, I had a pretty tough time defending my base for the first time, but I also really didn't know like a whole lot of what was going on. You can also basically um, you build walls out of like wood, stone, or metal. That's what I was trying to figure out. Okay, you can right. also, yeah, so you can go around, you can mine those resources from trees, cars, um, you know, brick and mortar buildings. You can also make traps to put on the side of your building and on like the ceilings and stuff. So if they do kind of get in towards the area that you're protecting, um, they get hit by traps and stuff. So it's, there's a lot going on. And I jumped into, um, I, I didn't get a chance to play with any friends. So any of the missions that I did, um, it put me in matchmaking. And I kind of, I don't know, I felt like the people that I was matchmaked with, they were still trying to figure the game out. So there was a lot of exploring of the maps going on and not really playing the objective. Like everyone wanted to do the bonus side quest object objectives, which might be like save survivors, find, you know, X amount of parts, you know, for whatever, you know, upgrades and stuff like that. And um, it, I feel like it would be more fun 
if I went in with a dedicated us. group of four. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. With us, it would be more of a dedicated group of four, and we could do these side objectives together. And then once you you know get done exploring and all that stuff, you can put um, this blue glow stuff into a machine, which then activates the storm, which brings in all the husks. So you can choose when the the horde when, starts coming yeah, the in at you. Yeah, coming. Okay, that's pretty cool. Before yeah. that, yeah. before that happens, you're like you're kind of placed into a map, and you go out and explore the map. There's buildings, there's caves, there's kind of all sorts of stuff. And the maps aren't huge on a per level basis, but there's enough. There's enough to each one so far that I feel like good about doing ten minutes worth of just exploring. You know, like it's, oh, it's an oh, interesting, yes. it's an okay, interesting thanks. play loop because you start off in, like I, I've learned through experience that you always got to be concerned about ammo in this game, um. So you really want to make sure that you're you're covered for ammo, so you're not looking for ammo when the horde fight actually starts, um. And that was really convoluted too. At no point did I ever see it explained that you needed to, you know. Hold the reload button to make ammo, right? Like, I, I I was lucky enough to be playing this on stream. So chat was walking me through You're a lot of stuff, okay. right? And then you get a certain kind of survivor that you could use as a defender. And you have to give him a, a gun and a and ammo. And I couldn't figure out how to give him ammo, right? And no, like, I didn't see it explained anywhere that you could you know, drop ammo from inside your inventory and that that guy would go pick it up. So there was like stuff like that. I found it really fun once I got everything working, but it was really frustrating. There's even these three bars that show up in game on your UI. And those bars, one I think is for building, one is for killing, and one is for, I can't remember what the other one's for, but as you fill these up as a team, um, it means you're gonna get better rewards at the end. But at no point is that explained what I'm looking at. What What are those three bars? like? How am I supposed to interpret that? What? Why are they filling up? Because you got to think, if you're playing this with people you've never met, you just got match made. Those bars are filling up because somebody else is doing something on the other side of the map that you don't even know about, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the game is fun. It's a little confusing. I highly recommend if you got a friend who's already started playing with it, play with him first so he can like you know kind of introduce you to this stuff because it's a little confusing at first. Do you yeah. think it's possible that with the the game being so convoluted, it'll turn people off before they? get to that precipice where it's fun for them? Does it last that long where people are confused, you think? I think you can get over it pretty quickly. Um, I think at first, like, yeah, there might be a few people that are like, uh, you know, I tried it out, you know, it wasn't really for me. I know a lot like of people that, who lack patience, yeah. Patience yeah. Is I think once you give it time and you see how in-depth it goes with, like, you know, grinding for weapons and blueprints and things like that, it's it's pretty cool. It's fun. And I really like grindy games with like a RPG esque element to it. And it's always yeah. much better. You know, I haven't played it with friends yet, but I can tell you right now, it's going to be a lot better, like being able to explore the map with friends and accomplish a lot of these goals together instead yeah. of just what's that guy mm -hmm. over there doing. And I think you'll get better rewards too, Wilson, because you'll yeah. be working as a team to, you know, get those objectives done as opposed to everybody just kind of going and doing whatever. Like at one point, there's, there's a limit to how much the game wants you to build up your fortress on a map like it'll say like only use like 200 pieces to build your fortress before the horde comes and if you got three guys all building at the same time that 200 gets used up really quick you know and all of a sudden you're 205 so you lose that bonus you know yeah wow i mean this game sounds like it's something that is really only possible with modern cooperative gaming and an online infrastructure um i guess building on from that how do we think that the internet has changed um the way that we game and the way that we approach our our games because our next topic which almost has seen this transition is is how has internet changed the way that you game i thought fortnite is a great example because if that was a solo game i think it'd have a very very limited expiration date you get bored of it very very quickly but the fact you can bring all four of your buddies in and dig in and kind of fight off the halls together makes it suddenly instantly replayable how has internet changed gaming for you guys and i mean it's <laughs> It's a lot. How long I mean, do we I, have? Yeah, I guess. I guess to You've start. You've got about ten minutes, and this time I'm going to push you on it. <laughs> uh, I, I guess to start, you'd have to go back and look at like how I gamed as a kid, like sofa gaming, birthday parties. Anytime you had a friend over for a sleepover was really the only time. Like I, I had a sister too that would play every now and then, but she didn't enjoy all the games that I did. So it was just when you had a friend and a second controller, 
So it's pretty limited back then. And like moving on towards, I guess, like high school, it kind of changed once like our area got high speed internet and I was able to do my first like Xbox Live experience with like, mm. um, um, like uh halo and Ghost stuff Recon. like that yeah but like i guess even before that though you look at like the original halo and it was really all about the land parties you know with quake and doom and everybody hauling their the rigs start, over yeah. to uh, hauling their rigs over to one place which was strenuous but it was you know you had a good time and it was really worth it and then it was back in the day towards... crt tvs you weren't moving no oh. lcd monitor uh, <laughs> no you weren't <laughs> <laughs> no, you weren't. Those things were huge. And, uh, you know, and then you move on towards like high school. I started getting, you know, my Xbox 360, looked into internet and uh, started playing like Halo 3. And it was really like I really only gamed with close friends that like I knew and were interested in it. But like I also made a few friends like outside of IRL in real life. You know what I mean? Like people over the internet that became friends that I actively would seek out to play a game with them and then you move to currently and i mean it's an obvious you know choice for me for to pick this game but destiny has completely changed the way that i online game with friend you know i have met friends i mean practically family we talk regularly we have a discord we have each other's phone numbers we hang out in psn chat even when we're playing different games and to be honest uh, in a nutshell the way it's changed me I'd say it's made me become more outgoing and realize how better games are with friends and connect with people all over the world that I wouldn't even have a chance to if people have a similar mindset, you know? Um, how about you, Beasley? Man, God, let me try to squeeze this out for Gary real quick. <laughs> um, this thing for me, uh, the internet and the way the internet has affected me has been just insurmountable because I'm an old guy. I remember playing competitive <laughs> games with my brothers and we would take like a piece of cardboard and stick it in between the screen because oh, yeah. you didn't want people to, to screen watch. You know, if you're playing like Mario Kart or something, you don't want the person to know where, where you were or get the advantage on you. Gold the, internet, the internet for me, <laughs> it turned my living room into the world. Um, and that's what it's done. It's created this huge community where it used to be three or four people on the couch, exactly what you said. Now that, that experience has drifted out into the world. There's so many aspects of gaming that have changed. Competitive, uh, co-op, you know, all these things that exist now, ubiquity across the world just didn't exist back then. Very few games would even try it back then. Now you can talk to people. I mean, I remember the first time I heard a person's voice on the Xbox when I had the headset and I was like, what is, that's really a person's voice? I couldn't believe it. I'm an old guy. I used to have, you know, dial up internet. I know what it's all about. I know how it all started. For me, it's just been an amazing thing to watch. You know, my kids are growing up in the era of PS4, and everything is just so easy. Yeah, you know, I grew We're up probably in the, era the last generation that'll remember a world without internet, right? Probably, yeah. right? I mean, it it's so funny thinking about the future. You know, now the parents are the ones teaching the kids how to game. You know, when we grew up, Brian, our parents thought it was a, a complete waste of time. If that, they never did it, and it's like everything has changed around this culture of gaming. And I think that being able to go online and, and, and meet people, like Wilson said, and, and environments and communities like Destiny meet real tangible and have meaningful relationships with people that you would have never had this opportunity to before. The internet changed everything. It changed it for all of us. I think it's been an amazing thing to see. That's where I met that's all you guys. That's something I mean, we take for granted, really, man. I mean, we really do take it for granted. We met each other online, pretty much all of us. Some of us met playing video games. Some of us met on YouTube with the internet. I met really Wilson. Turned I was I was reaching under the stall for some toilet paper at a gas and gas. He was right next to you, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "I got you." <laughs> it was you know friendship made in heaven ever since. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's heaven, bro, but it probably yeah, comes. I met Briar on a website. I think it was bearsfortwinks.com. Um, mm, that was a good one, familiar. familiar. Yeah, I was I was just looking for someone to hold me tightly and tell me they love me, and he fit the bill. It is. I'm happy you guys got friendly. I mean, uh, I've got a much um, <laughs> more succinct answer, really, from the way modern internet's changed my gaming. I've got, like, three monitors. Uh, and the biggest thing the internet's changed in mind is at least two of them are filled at any one time with copious amounts of hardcore pornography. <laughs> so <laughs> that's really been the biggest change for me is that I get my game plus distractions. But, yes. um, yeah. yeah. I think you guys summed that up nicely. I think I didn't even get to talk about it yet. 
No, I'm not. I'm not moving on. I'm just sort of building on their points. He said, "Fuck you, bro." Man, listen, I, I get one gag. I don't even get to make a real point. It's terrible. The Yoko of the show. Um, so, my um, my view on it is that the the internet has made games viable that just wouldn't be viable. And we spoke about Fortnite being one of them. Like before the the internet, you had arcade games and games that were designed to be played local co-op. You know, beat 'em ups, um, things like Streets of Rage, Double Dragon, right. things that were gauntlet. Games that were designed to be played, two people in the same room there. The internet has made games possible that just wouldn't be feasible games anywhere else. You know, things like um, Werewolves Within, which you spoke around on VR. Like, that's not going to work if there's four of you sitting around a TV in the same room. You know, it's not something that has that capacity to do it. I think the the anonymity of having remote locations has really been, you know, just allowed games to flourish that wouldn't be considered games. Um, you know, Evolve and things of like that. I suppose you could probably play Evolve in the same room. You wouldn't want to, but you could play in the same room. We just wouldn't um, want to play Evolve. Yeah, you just wouldn't wouldn't play it full stop. <laughs> what, what do you think, Brian? You might might be able to. Yeah, For me, you know, there always it. has been like, uh, you know, gaming like togetherness, right? But it was it was, it was a local thing. It was you know, my friends came over and we'd have four player Halo, you know, matches and be laughing and hitting each other and giggling the whole time. And then as I grew up and, you know, like, obviously, you know, friends started getting families and, you know, moving further distances, that became less of a thing. So gaming became much more of a solitary experience where I'd sit down and I'd play a single player experience for, you know, eight hours. Maybe I'd jump online. I'd, you know, I did a lot of Halo 2, Halo 3 online stuff, and I really enjoyed that. But it was never as much fun as playing with my friends, right? Like, knowing that I just, you know, did something like shot one of my friends was ultimately much more satisfying experience. You know, having that personal like experience was much better than just randomly shooting a guy in the face online. Absolutely. And that's so how true. it stayed for me for years and years because because of the games I was playing and because of the games that really spoke to me as the most fun games like Call of Duty, like Halo or as just competitive shooters the community aspect of those games never appealed to me at all. You know, what from what I saw, it was mostly just, you know, Assholes. dick measuring contests, you know? <laughs> and I just like to get on there. I like to have some fun and then log off. Destiny changed that for me. And I suspect that this is an experience that Gary's actually been having for a very long time playing uh, WoW. And, like, MMO guys have been having for a very long time. is because Destiny brought us together and made us work together. Then all of a sudden we started forming friendships, right? It's like getting getting people together and working toward a raid as a six man team. You can't help but start forming some bonds inside that fire team, even if you just got together for you know an hour or two off of LFG. Like by the end of it, you often know the personalities of each one of your squad mates. You know, it's a, it's amazing thing that never happened to me in Call of Duty. I'd say that in Destiny, you've actually experienced more than that. So coming off the MMO bandwagon, MMOs bring a lot of people together and you have really vibrant and really lit um, guild chats or clan chats, you know, that are on there. Uh, but in reality, you don't get to know the people you're playing with any more than they're just like a number on the damage meter. I mean, you've got to think in Destiny, the raids are six people. So everyone's got a, a relatively predominant place, you know, to talk. But vanilla World of Warcraft, they were 40 man raids. You can't have 40 people on a mic. It's chaos. So there'd be a raid leader, maybe one or two other people that were like, could talk, and everyone else was just text chat, and they were focused with doing what they were doing. So for me, Destiny's been the sweet spot where it stripped it back and made it more about the person, you know, the fire team, and the people that you meet and you you uh, form relationships with. I think I think Destiny's in a very, very odd spot. I think Bungie kind of caught lightning in a bottle with it in terms of the community aspect. I think that's why they're doubling down on it for Destiny 2. Uh, yeah, I've, I mean, PC's definitely had the community games but none of them have captured a community that destiny has i think it's, it stands alone in that I think space you nailed it with uh lightning in a bottle i think yeah. that was perfect yeah um ultimately but... it's made games more fun to me now now i don't want to play i don't want to i love PUBG. playing PUBG solo is fun playing PUBG with beastly gary and wilson is a ton of fun because we're laughing the whole time when the, when the game's boring the game's not boring because we're we're making fun of somebody 
for some dumb shit, right? Where, you know, like, oh, you drove into a tree, ha, ha you know, like, it, there's always something we can be laughing about or talking about. So, like, just, it, it's come back to playing with your friends. It's a social experience as opposed to a, to a solo experience. Uh, it's, it's less like reading a book and more like going to see a movie, you know, with your friends. It's, be, it's become a community thing. Uh, and to me, much better than it ever has been in the past. It's, uh, gaming is more fun to me than than it has been in the last 15 years since I used to sit on the couch with three of my best friends playing Halo. Yeah, I mean, uh, back back when we were growing up, you know, video games were fun. But it's grown to a point now where it's, in, at least in my opinion, the number one form of entertainment in my life and in my family's life. I mean, just look at this. The, the simple fact, Briar, is I've known you now for almost four years. We've never met face to face and shook hands. Hard years on it. Beastly. He's aged a lot in those four years. <laughs> but <laughs> knowing me for that long is not easy. <laughs> it's rough. But just just look at how look how I mean, I'm saying all the time we spent together and the things we've done together playing video games. You and Wilson, you and Gary. The internet allows that, and I think the future is even brighter. Great example you used earlier, Gary. Uh, Werewolves Within. That's a very special kind of experience. Uh, and it would only work to me online. You're sitting around a table with people you never met before, actually carrying on a conversation. And it feels so natural and it feels so special at the same time because you know it's taking place through the magic of the Internet. I think the Internet's here to stay, guys. I don't think anyone, any, anyone's going to pull the, the cord or pull the plug on the Internet and send us back to the old days of the NES. It's going to get better, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get into it. It's us. <laughs> I know where you're going with this shit, bro. You better stay off. Leave him alone. They just want you to use it less in their way. <laughs> right? They don't want to take it away. They just want you to pay more for it. Look, yeah. let's just all let's go just to all the keep sites net. they want you to go to. Can we just keep net neutrality on the conversation, please? I think we should move. <laughs> On to our next topic, because um, I think we've kind of exhausted that. What do we think about the, well, one, the stern look that Brian's given us on his frozen webcam, and two, the low cost of PC gaming? What I gotta do we say, think about it? Can I just talk about Brian's frozen webcam? I he's know, been making the same stern. face for, for a long fucking time. It's great. <laughs> I feel like he's staring into my soul. I feel like he sees what's on my web history. Like, look at that look. <laughs> yeah. That's the look of a man who's just. It's so crazy. <laughs> And, and the thing that's really intimidating is when he starts to talk, it goes full screen, and he's really staring at you then. <laughs> like, holy shit. I know. That's Bro, do you want to take the lead on this one, or are you going to be We, we got to talk about your Skype settings if I'm going full screen, BC. <laughs> I don't know what to We got to fix about. that shit. Uh, I don't have the document pulled up, Gary. Okay, well, then I'll lead there. Um, Briar's um, introduced a topic for us this week around the low cost of PC gaming. Really, I guess... PC gaming in the past has always been seen as, um, at least by, you know, filthy elitist by myself, as the uh, the reign of the the prestigious. You know, we we don't allow the console peasants in. You know, we've got our doors closed. We're all about frame rates, high resolutions, etc. But I guess within the past twelve to eighteen months, there's been a relative stagnation of technology, and it's led to the technology dropping in price and games becoming much more affordable to play on the PC. You know. Four hundred dollars. Um, just plug in Briar's latest video if you haven't checked it. Hit the Briar Rabbit channel up for a four hundred dollar Destiny Two build. Um, yeah, Briar put a video out for a Destiny Two PC that hits the minimum specs for the game for four hundred dollars, which is less than the cost of the upcoming Xbox One X. So with PC gaming being affordable um, within the, uh, the kind of the price range of the console player, notice I said player there, not peasant. I was being generous. What do we think about? PC gaming now being accessible to one and all. Now, I didn't get a chance to see this video, and I'm definitely going to check it out. You guys make sure you do, you do too, if you hadn't. Now, this $400 PC that you uh, that you showed in your video, Briar, does it allow you to play Destiny at 60 frames, or would it be 30? If I explain the video, why would you go watch it? You're absolutely right. I'll go watch the video now. <laughs> God damn it. Good point. Now, the, uh, Destiny or Bungie released the minimum specs for what a Destiny 2 capable PC would be. And they were much lower than I think anybody had anticipated. They were really low specs. Um, so they, they did four sets of specs, uh, four, two with older hardware and two with brand new hardware. So I took the minimum recommended specs for the brand new hardware and priced it out on PC Part Picker. Uh, and it came down to $404.81. 
Does that to get include a, a to build. No. Um, but you probably have a TV that you can hook it up to. Uh, if you're really that cash strapped that you can't afford a monitor in addition to that, you can easily hook this thing up to the same TV that you pl- you plug your PlayStation into or your Xbox into. Uh, it also doesn't come with a mouse and keyboard. Um, so you'll probably have to, uh, you know, beg, borrow, or steal, you know, to get a mouse and keyboard. Um, but what's interesting about it is that it's the same price as a PlayStation 4 Pro. And it's hundred dollars less than an Xbox One X. So, for me, it brings up a very interesting option for a lot of gamers who are being enticed by playing Destiny Two in 4K, 30 frames per second. You know, they have a PlayStation Four, and they're thinking, "Do I want to buy a PlayStation Four Pro for Destiny Two? Mm-hmm. I have an Xbox One. Do I want to buy an Xbox One X for Destiny Two? The interesting thing about this PC is that no, it's not a high-end PC. But it's going to get you into the PC gaming sphere, right? It's going to give you access to Steam. It's going to give you access yes. to, uh, you know, all these PC games that you previously didn't have access to. So, you, theoretically, you keep your PlayStation 4 or you keep your Xbox. And then, in addition, you buy into an entirely new platform instead of just buying into or re-upping on, in a platform that you already own. So, with the PlayStation 4 Pro... You buy that, and you, now the games that you already own look better. You can keep your PlayStation 4, buy into a PC, and get access to a whole new world of games. A whole but you don't new lose world. out on the you don't lose out on the PlayStation 4 ecosystem. You just don't get the Pro upgrade. Exactly, I can confirm this because that's exactly what I did. Uh, I was looking into getting a PS4 Pro for the release of Destiny 2. And uh, shout outs to uh, Great American Hero in the chat. He hooked me up. He was going to build a new PC that he dubbed Skynet. Uh, and he wanted to uh, sell me his old PC parts. So, or basically his old computer. So I jumped on it and I don't regret it. Like I had done PC gaming. A lot of my stuff was outdated. I couldn't do a lot of the new games and have them run at optimal perform- playable optimal performance. And I don't regret the decision one bit. I've had a blast. Uh, you get access to thousands of games that you normally wouldn't. And the Steam community is growing. A lot of people are jumping on this. Uh, I don't really want to call it the bandwagon, but I got a lot of friends that have moved over to PC recently and have been having a great time. And it's not permanent. Like you said, Briar, the, the PlayStation's there. Your friends mm-hmm. list is there. You know, you can jump on there and play whatever games you want. You know, I was just playing Borderlands last night with uh, my girlfriend and some Tower Life buddies, you know, and... Um, the experience is always there. So why limit yourself to your experiences and just grab a PC and check it out? Quick question, Briar. This $400 build, do you think, like if you were to theorize, is it possible this thing can do VR? No. No, okay. I'm thinking if it's close in power to the PS4, then possibly, but of course the yeah. HTC Vive and stuff is more powerful than the PSVR. Yeah. I mean, you like, it might do it. Dollar VR builds, but that, yeah. that you're really scraping the barrel. If you yeah. want good performance in VR, you need a better kit. Yeah. You know, some of some of the VR games uh, require much, you know, higher tech. So, I think it's Lone Echo. Lone, Lone Echo is that is that a thing? Whatever it is, Echo something. Uh, a new game that's just come out on the Oculus that requires a 1080 to play. So, you know, it's there's there's degrees of VR as to what you want. But that probably not. Even if it could run a game, you probably would struggle to maintain the the ninety frames per second that you'd need. Yeah, this is going to be this is going to be a PC for four hundred dollars. It's going to be a PC that gets you uh, low to medium settings in games at you know a hopefully sixty frames per second. You know, it's not this thing is not a hot rod. It's gotcha. It's getting you it's into start, the ecosystem. Though. Get your foot then, in the door. Yeah, you get your foot in the door. You can start playing games with your friends on PC. You also get the added benefit of having this huge back catalog of games that you've never played. Uh, if you've never experienced the Steam Store, there is an incredible amount of games on there that are very, very cheap. Mm-hmm. You know, so you can start playing games right away for two or three dollars for, you know, games that were AAA titles two or three years ago. 
Yeah. There's a lot of good free games on there, too. So, I mean, there you are. can start playing immediately. I mean, Team Fortress 2 is a free game, I believe. Yeah. Like, I think it comes pre-installed with it, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah. I mean, I think... Paladins is a great title, yep. and while it's PS4, you obviously you get it with PC control. Another thing that I'd say can't be understated is, is mouse and keyboard input, which doesn't work on all genres, but certainly for the first-person shooter is almost undeniably the best way to play it. You know, it's just the precision that you get with a mouse and keyboard you can't replicate with a controller. Uh, and I know games like Destiny are built around a controller, but that's just, you know, liberal use of aim assist to make a controller feel competent. Um, for me, I think that, as Briar said, that $400 price tag to get you access to that style of gaming uh, is great. And, and RTS games, uh, ARPG games that are really low demand, things like uh, Diablo or Pillars of Eternity or Path mm -hmm. of the Exile. But those sorts of games are huge. Baldur's Gate. All these click games that don't really work very well on a controller, immediately you've got the capability to play. So, yeah, I mean, I don't see any excuse for people to say, I am a console gamer, I don't like PC. You know, you can run a PC, all of these, like Briar said, you can run on a TV. So whatever you're playing your PlayStation on, arguably you could plug the PC let, into let, if you really want. That just... being said, though, I completely hate PCs. <laughs> I can't understand them. <laughs> that being said. I really do. I like, I mean... I've been I've been really like hardcore using a PC now for like the last yeah, year, man. and like I can't tell you the amount of frustration it's given me with drivers. Really? Like, why are drivers still a fucking thing on the PC side when they've totally gotten rid of it on the Mac side? Why do I still have to install DLLs? And why is there still a registry? And why is there still Windows rot? And like, why are these things so fucking unreliable? <laughs> <laughs> okay, rant over. <laughs> Topic for another day. Topic for another day. I just want, <laughs> Gary, I just wanted to say to you, first of all, thank you for sending me that code for hard reset. It's the best playing game on my computer. It outperforms really? anything I've ever seen on this computer. I couldn't believe how fast it was. And, you know, at the highest settings, I, I had to take this into the living room and show my wife. She was like, oh, my God. It was. It had to be doing 70, 80 frames per second. That's and a six-year-old game, by the way, as well. Oh, well, fuck you too, Gary. Anyway, I just thought, <laughs> I wanted to say thank you. For sending me that code because it was it was really a, an enlightening experience playing that and it felt so different than anything I played on the console just because of the speed alone. So uh, it was it was a kind of a special experience for me because I got this twelve hundred dollar uh, giant weight of a laptop that I wish I had talked to Briar about before I spent my money because I would have eight hundred dollars to buy my wife. Uh, I would have told you to buy a Mac. To be honest with thongs, it's either a lot of cheap thongs or one very expensive thong. <laughs> Damn, that's quality a great question. Quantity. I mean, price, price to panty ratio on a thong as well is way off, I've always found. Because you can get the big old, you know, the, the big no. ass kind of no. grey looking nana kind of underwear for half no. the price of a thong. And a thong's just effectively string and a bit of fabric. It's a string. You know, really. Yeah. But all we, that's all I want, just thongs. Yeah. I'm just surprised you guys call them thongs and not something more elaborate. Tangles or jeans. What do you, what do you, what do you call them? <laughs> No, no, that's what I was saying. Uh, Gary, I was like, I'm surprised, you know, they call him thongs over there because he's always got a better word for everything. I've called him a yeah. walking thesaurus. <laughs> no, we're, <laughs> we're absolutely filthy in the Europe. Like, don't worry about us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that was Briar's topic. We're moving on to the next topic, which is the Lawbreakers beta, which is something I briefly played. We talked about it pre-show, and we wanted to give our first impressions uh, playing on PV PC versus consoles, also something that's available and capable in this game. Gary, would you like to get us started? Because I believe you played the most of this beta, Lawbreakers. What do you think of it? So I played the alpha, I played the closed beta, and I played the open beta on it. So I've seen wow. the evolution of the game um, go through. I'm a big fan of, of um, Cliffy B as a developer. Oh, sorry, as a... Did he be a developer? Yeah, I guess he yeah, would be a developer. Yeah. I was a big fan of, of, of him and the stuff that he produced, the early stuff that he did with Gears. I, I really like the bombastic over the top action games that are kind of you know they don't take themselves too seriously and they're all about player skill and rewarding player skill so lawbreakers itself is designed to take the overwatch kiddies and just bend them over a table um and that's kind of what it does persistently <laughs> um for like the whole time you play it so the games sure. are super fast the matches are super long um it can snowball really quickly you can die if you're poorly positioned or have bad aim uh, and there's very, very little incentive to play as a team. It's all about lone wolf in it, which all of those things really appeal to me. That's kind of like a game perfectly built for me. Um, the game 
I guess the, the way to describe it, if you've not played it, is Titanfall meets Unreal Tournament. Uh, if they were both snorting a lot of coke before they came out into so the arena. So true, yes. It's like super fast, super aggressive. You really need verticality, wall running. Um, it's it's arguably a hero shooter because there are tanks, quote unquote, support, melee, um, ranged heavies. But that being said, it's not a hero shooter in the way Overwatch is. So any class can easily outplay any other class. You know, 1v1 anyone. Whereas in Overwatch, if you're Tracer going against Roadhog, you're going to have a hard time, no matter how good you are at Tracer. I mean, it's possible, but it's difficult. Or, you know, there's obviously other uh, counters there. But for me, Lawbreakers just, yeah, felt sweet. So I I haven't played nearly as long as you, but are you saying there's really no Achilles heel to to certain characters? It's just all skill-based in this versus (laughs) the way that Overwatch kind of sets it up. Each character has their own Achilles heel and another character. Wilson might have um, some other views on it as well, playing PC too. But my, my view was, no, there's certain classes that are more geared to take on other classes. But as a on a whole, as long as you're skilled and you're capable with your you class... You have a chance, okay. Yeah, you have, I mean, more than a chance. I mean, Wraith, which... Wilson and I had dirty Wraith mains, which is kind of like being a Hanzo main in Overwatch. Um, Wraith is, again, kind of like a Titanfall 2 pilot on acid. Um, it's like <laughs> Titanfall 2 pilot to the extreme and that thing just runs circles around everyone it's got like a katana blade SMGs it, you know if a, if a guy's a tank you can just outmaneuver them if a guy's got heavy weapons you can move around them if they're an assassin you can keep range on them again you, you can outplay people no matter what class they are I don't know Wilson did you find yeah, it? yeah yeah it's really good I will say um, what's the class with the robot that can put up like like the titan wall like how they do now do you know the name of that class he's uh, a little juggernaut, robot juggernaut he they i mean he's definitely lives up to his name like you know they're more of the tanky more defensive you know he can throw up a wall and things like that the thing i like the most about the wraith is that and this is really with all characters um movement speed and movement ability is crucial so with the Wraith, you have a slide. Instead of holding shift to sprint, your guy slides on the ground, sort of like Titanfall. And then you have a triple jump, like Bones of Ao, where you can like jump three times. And by the time that gives you momentum as you go along, and by the time you hit the ground again, your slide has recharged, so you can slide back in, triple jump out. So I gotta really, try this character. It's really all about kicking off walls, um, moving around, like like Gary said, just outmaneuvering, outclassing. Like, if you know that you're going up against a Juggernaut, that you're going to get some damage on him, and he's going to throw up a wall and throw down a defensive position, and there's certain areas, mostly um, the center of the map, has an extremely low amount of gravity. So when you pass through sort of a red-looking overshield, you know that you're going into a really low gravity area. So these, I don't know if you've seen the um, the trailer or whatever, the cinematic trailer. Yeah. It's just like that. People flying, flying through the sky. Yeah. You know, there's a chick that's kind of like Farrah um, from Overwatch, but she's got a, a minigun instead of a rocket. Um, she even does uh, like a death from above where she like hits the ground with like a Titan smash and stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, you get you get a couple abilities. Um the Wraith I really like, he almost does like a Warlock melee, but it shoots out all these little like purple subsonic rings and it slows everyone down. So a game that is primarily based on movement speed and movement ability, you have now nerfed their number one asset. And that's what I think Wraith really comes in. It's not like a 60 second cooldown, so you can't just spam it. It's not like a traditional melee, it's an actual ability. And um, Wraith is really the, uh, Wraith was the first character I picked, and I have probably put not as much as Gary, me about four or five hours into the game, and I haven't played any other character. Like he, Wraith feels incredibly strong. But Gary had said it um, was a little bit of uh, Unreal Tournament meets um, what did you say it was, Gary? He Unreal said Titanfall. 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 Yes, meets Titanfall meets War. Unreal Tournament. Um, I think it to me it has an old school Quake feel of yeah. movement, of really fast, smooth movement, and um, with a little bit of an Overwatch feel of um, the fact that you have options for different, you know, they're not called heroes in this game, but like in Overwatch, they're called heroes. So there's lots of options out there for everyone, and you can have multiple rates on one team. 
Yeah. So it's not like Overwatch in a sense where when you pick a character or a character type, like, you know, that's Someone it. Else can't so. do it. Yeah. Well, right. my wife and I played this. I played for the first time yesterday, but today we played for about two hours together. The character I played with the most was the Assassin, which is a female who's kind of an up-close melee character, but she also has an SMG, and she's able to kind of teleport through the air three times. Uh, my takeaway from this game is the speed just kind of blew me away. When I, I spent so much time playing Overwatch, it reminded me of Overwatch, but after playing it, seeing the visual aesthetic, the the, the characters, and, and the way that they've kind of built the game the gameplay around these characters, it feels like an adult version of Overwatch to me. Now I feel like going back to Overwatch is kind of a step in the wrong direction because of the, the speed, the verticality, uh, the different ways of playing. And I, I can't wait for this game. I, I honestly, I've been downloading betas all week. So I've been playing, you know, you know, uh, I forget the name of the zombie game, Dead Alliance. I've been playing that. But Lawbreakers is the one that kind of caught me off guard. I really like that game. I'd love to get in there and play with you guys if we had a chance. It seems pretty damn awesome. And that will when definitely the beta be one of the games I pick up. Uh, I think it's ending today, maybe, for PC. I thought it was tomorrow. I thought Might I could be, be wrong about that. I thought I mean, it was tomorrow. Uh, it's quite unapologetic in how, I guess, the demand it puts on you as a player. So my criticisms of the game, and they still haven't been addressed. Um, not the Cliffy B's waiting on the phone for my criticisms anyway, but the things <laughs> that I've been, been asking for. Well, this is scary. Alpha, I gotta yeah, wait for let's address it. <laughs> I know. Can we can we stop the podcast? Cliff's on the phone. Um, yeah, and they, the things I've been asking for is I, I feel that it almost feels too weathering. If you're playing at a very, very high level, the match times are intentionally a little bit too long. So the match times they set at about 20 minutes um, if they run to time. Wow. And 20 minutes at that speed, I mean, best way to describe it is, I mean, you know when you're playing Tracer on Overwatch, this feels like tr Tracer at 200% speed. Yeah. So Tracer's slow in comparison with this game. Um, you're moving very, very quickly. The, the kills and the frags are coming fast. You know, that there's really precision aim required because there's very little to no aim assist as far as I can tell on the PC version. You can blind fire behind you as a maneuver uh, if people are chasing you. As Wilson said, the amount of zero G and verticality that there is in the game is unprecedented. You know, you're constantly up at 100 foot, 200 foot above where you're playing yeah. to and you're moving around. Um, it's weathering. You know, if you're playing that for 20 minute <laughs> games and trying to play it at that level, that, that high level of, of play for 20 solid minutes, it's tiring um, and, and the game isn't very welcoming to new players. You can go into a match and you can die 20 times, 30 times and get no kills. Well, what, what's a reward is... system like? Like what? Oh yeah. You know, yeah, like Overwatch important. has, you know, like boxes to open, you know, like this we're getting kind of used thing. to the same thing. Yeah. Same yeah. thing. Same you've thing. got, skins. you've got um, character skins, uh, we weapon skins, weapon stickers, player emblems and then there's like a footprint like if you like some characters have like a melee yeah. like like a traditional melee is their actual attack but um there's a if key that you can you. hit there's a key that you can hit where you're I remember if you like you kick in the old up, duke yeah. nukem yeah the old duke nukem games where you could kick that's what it looks like and you can unlock these different footprints that you leave when you kick stuff and kick people and yeah. uh there's a lot of customization um, with the loot drops, so I'm not quite exactly sure how I obtained them. I mean, I'm sure by leveling up or maybe completing challenges, but at the end of every game, I was having in the beta one to two of those loot boxes open up, and you get four drops out of every box, uh -huh. um, similar to Overwatch. Um, and I got some pretty cool, some pretty cool weapon skins, man, for my wraith. I was pretty stoked about that, and it gives you the uh, I believe you said it best one time, that little dopamine drip of um, excitement when you get a good drop. And then, oh, it's for my character. Or if it's anything like Overwatch, it'll never be anything never. for Hanzo. <laughs> never get a Hanzo skin. I kind of feel That's like the universe with... telling you to stop playing Hanzo. I don't listen. <laughs> I feel like with Lawbreakers, like, it's, the cosmetic aspect of it is less important. At least to me, it was more about um the skill and beating people and just totally. being dominant on the map like i didn't care what i looked like i didn't care if i got a gum with like you know smoke 420 cannabis leaves all over it like it, whatever i don't i don't really care i do <laughs> <laughs> that's like but, my favorite skin that's the one i got okay no, <laughs> but for me it was just that that's the sort of game again where you're going to get people that are very very dominant assert their dominance all over a map and i think it's going to put a lot of people off that aren't 
that are used to games like Destiny and Overwatch that are very forgiving in their aim. You've got characters like May and Mercy that anyone can pick up and play, and Symmetra. Right. Um, this game has nothing like that. It all requires precision aim, and it requires you to know the recoil pattern, the firing pattern of the weapons, the distances that the weapons are effective. They don't explain any of that. So like yeah. Wraith, for example, has an SMG that if you hold fire it for more than about four or five rounds, the spread, the bloom on it, just blooms to half the screen. And if you use it at anything more than 45, 50 meters, you have to shoot maybe one or two bullets from a shot. The idea is that you get close, you spray someone down, and then you finish with a melee. But they don't explain that to you. It's a game that is is brutal in its treatment of new players. And Cliff has designed it in that way. He wants it to be a hardcore shooter that harkens back to the old days. So they're not even um, targeting like a mass audience here. They're really just targeting the, the most hardcore of the sweatiest of the sweat community. I I believe so. Like Unreal that was, tournament I think he, players. I think he nailed it. Like I didn't like have I at any point in time during that beta, I did not feel like my hand was being held or anything was being explained to me. It's like you should know how to play capture the flag. You should know how to play capture points. You should know how to um similar to capture the flag, you gotta grab a battery, bring it bring it back to your base, charge it up. So you basically bring it back to your base and defend it. No, you're going to know all these things and all the different characters. I really do think that they cater to players in a sense that the amount of different characters you can play, I do believe that there's a character there for every play style that you want to play. Um, something else, too, I've been meaning to ask you guys, did you guys feel that with that, I, that zero gravity, I thought was really interesting because I found ways around the map using that triple jump and yeah. the zero gravity areas that I don't think were intended. There's all these different flank routes and stuff that you can get. And like Gary said, it is very much like catered to you should know what the hell you're doing in a first person shooter by now. You know, okay. After he said that, I 100 percent agree with you, Gary. And it's something that, you know, passively I thought about. I didn't really actively think about it. The game is very difficult. It has a high learning curve for people who've never played these types of games. And there was no tutorial. There was no explanation. You just pick a character. They drop you in and you go. So that was something that uh, that you said that is 100 percent true. But I got I got two two things I want to talk about real quick about this uh, Lawbreakers. I it, my first impressions when I first saw the game when I first saw the cinematic trailer, I was thinking I wouldn't like it because I didn't like advanced warfare. I didn't like characters ping ponging around in advanced warfare. How you know the 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 boost system? I forget the system that they use where you had on these suits and you were shooting around the map. Briar, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The, I, my, mm, go ahead. I'm, I, I really thought that this game would feel like that, but it doesn't at all. It just feels like a smooth evolution of what we've kind of been going towards. And my second question, or at least my thought on it, is that this game is going to be PS4 cross-play with PC. Do you think that that's fair? Do you guys think they're going to change me, anything? Before you, before you get to that question, I, I want to just address the problem with Advanced Warfare, in my opinion, was that they added a new movement system in a game where the maps were still designed for the old movement system. There's been games yeah. with wild vertical movement for going back to tribes, the first one I could remember, and they worked. The problem was yeah. the maps weren't fucking at all designed for it. <laughs> it didn't feel like anyway. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Your second part. Great point, Brian. <laughs> uh, my, my second point is this game is going to be cross-play with PS4 and PC. Do you guys yeah. think they're going to... Do you, am I correct in that assumption, it's, Gary? I don't think it is. No, I think our point there was about what's it like playing on console versus PC because to me it feels like a game that you couldn't play on console, period. You may have a different experience to me. I've got stupid thumbs and I can't play controller. Um, to me, this game required such precision aim with a mouse. You know, I took hours to get it right. Um, once you nail it, you nail it, but it, I couldn't deliver that level of precision with a controller. I don't well, know. Is I'm there not... auto-aim on the PlayStation? Don't know. Uh, it, it yeah. might be a little bit. I mean, to me, I, it felt really good. And I felt like I, it was me controlling the direction of the little reticle. But, I mean, it, it's probably a little bit. It's it's a console game. Usually they put a little bit in there. So Yeah, like possibly. tutorial aside and stuff, like actually like getting kills and stuff like that on console, did, you, did it feel like, I don't want to say like easier because you didn't play it on PC, but did it feel like, I guess you kind of said it, you felt like you were the one in control. It wasn't yeah, it, like it, you were it, it missing all really, over the yeah. place. Yeah, I mean, I, I played another game, Dead Alliance, which is the beta is available now, too. I think it'll be over this weekend as well. That didn't feel feel nearly as uh, precise 
and the aiming. My wife and I played that, and we both agree, oh, we really don't like this. It'll probably take some time to get used to it, uh, you know, aiming and, and getting the shot precisely where you want it. But it didn't feel that way with Lawbreakers. I felt like it was just a smooth transition from what you've, you've, you've learned over the years playing first-person shooters on consoles. And it felt great. It, it's fast. And, so did uh, you play Overwatch on PS4? Yeah, I play it on PS4 all the time. Okay. Yeah, and, and I know you told me I uh, played on PC. Eh? You guys see me. A lot of people uh, enjoy it on pub- P- PS4. It, for some reason, it just doesn't work for me. Yeah, you guys, you guys see me PC. on PUBG and, and you see how horrible I am. Imagine me playing Overwatch on, on PC. It'd be a wrap. PUBG also, is going to come to the console. On. Like, I don't even know how that's going to work. Like, how's that going to play? I'm so excited. I'm so excited. <laughs> You guys have no idea how fucking happy I am about that. I'm just wondering if there's like oh. how how it's gonna feel on a controller versus a keyboard. Because I'll tell you right now, like at first it felt very very clunky. Like when the game first came out, they have been doing things to make it a little bit more fluent and like feel a little bit better. But as time has gone on, and certain keystrokes I don't have to think about anymore. Not even necessarily mm-hmm. where they're at, but like what keystroke does what action it it's become a lot more smooth you know and i watch um me and briar got a friend uh sweep who's in chat he is you watch him play and his movement speed is very fluent i mean it's just about getting comfortable with the keyboard i'm wondering how it's actually like not going to play like yeah there'll probably be a little bit of aim assist but i want to know how it's going to feel on a controller after I've spent months and months on a keyboard. Well, That's what I'm really, really... Let me just say this. I, I've dabbled with the PS4 on Steam playing PUBG. It actually works pretty well, but I think my settings were a little too high, so I was getting a little bit you know, of frame difference. It wasn't the frame rate that I wanted, and so it actually controlled pretty well, but the, the fact that I wasn't getting the frames that I wanted, I was getting killed before I had an opportunity to actually pull out and do what I needed to do. I think For that me, my PC is the problem. One of the things about playing... Uh, I, I don't really have a preference playing a, a shooter on PC or on console. If it's done right on console, it can feel just as good as it does on PC with a mouse and keyboard. Like I think that Destiny feels awesome, and it's really fun to play with a controller. Um, and I don't really care, you know, when it, when it does out, come out for PC, and I'm sitting there grinding strikes. You can bet I'll be leaning back in my chair with my feet up on the table, running with a controller. Yep. Um, but on PC. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I on, didn't know that. in PUBG, what what's weird is is that we're playing a version of the game that has zero mm-hmm. aim assist, and you need aim assist to make a, a shooter feel good. Like if you ever play a game on a control on a controller that has zero aim assist for your like friendly fire guys, like and you're trying to shoot one of your friends who's running around, and it's got zero aim assist with a controller, it's really freaking hard to hit them. But then you try and shoot an enemy, and you lock like you lock right on, and it's easy to shoot them, right? Like there is, it's a it's a significant hard thing to do without aim assist, and because so many of those firefights are happening so far away, like how do they do aim assist when your enemy is literally like a quarter mile away? You know, that's a good point. <laughs> that's a really good point. It'll be interesting to see. It'll yeah. be, I mean, I'm going to check it out for sure. Like, Oh, for sure. Yeah, I got some friends that I don't have a chance to play PUBG with on PC, so definitely going to be getting it for Xbox, at least if anything, just yeah. to see how it plays. I mean, while you guys are playing PUBG and Xbox, it's a good chance for me to catch up on World of Warcraft as well. So, you know, we uh, both win. I don't feel like you need to catch up. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't feel like I you're feel behind. Like the world, yeah, I feel like the world needs to catch up to you. <laughs> <laughs> Gary was telling us how many hours he's got in World of Warcraft the other how day. How many Me hours and Wilson were Gary? just like, oh my god. Uh, I think we added up this week, and it's definitely about 11. It must be at least 11,000 hours. Must it, be. My wife calculated it out to be like, on average, <laughs> like some retarded amount of hours per day. And obviously, you're, like, you're skipping days. You're probably skipping months without going on playing it. Yeah. But your like, average per day hourly is like, I can't remember what it was. It was like three hours a day or something over the last 10 years. Well, since it, I mean, well that's the thing. And I, when I was playing well properly, um, when I say properly, like, you know, religiously during Burning Crusade, Vanilla, Wrath of the Lich King, I was easily doing 12 to 14 hour days easily. There's no, no qualms there, you know, and then there was the all nighters and there was the land parties. Then there was the, the raid learning. But I mean, nowadays I'll still do about 
if I'm playing a World of Warcraft session, I'll still do at least four hours, four or five hours. You have to. Wow. Well, we wow. were talking about. Briar was like, you know what? Maybe, maybe we should, Wilson. Maybe we should download it, get on there one night, check it out, see what it's all about. And then Gary dropped his hours, and Briar goes, you know what? On second thought, fuck that. <laughs> fuck that. <laughs> I, I was purely thinking it'd be funny to just, you know, get me and Wilson in there, like, because I'm, I played. I don't know, six hours of World of Warcraft when the game first launched. And I was like, Same. yeah, this isn't for me. This is boring. And I haven't touched it since. So I thought it'd be kind of fun, you know, to get us two noobs in there and just have Gary get angry at us for not knowing anything after he's put, you know, 100,000 hours into the game. <laughs> I could see us attacking attacking something off that we're way too underleveled for. And he's got to come in and save our ass or something. Right, I it'd thought be it'd great. be a fun stream to watch for would the viewer. It wouldn't be fun for Gary, but it would be fun for everybody else. <laughs> I'll be down, so I've got my uh, my Illidan Stormrage chair adornment there. This is uh, it's my hoodie. So for anyone who's a WoW well nerd, they'd be, they'd be right down with that hoodie that I've got there. But no, it's... Yeah, I mean, for me, it's a sense of nostalgia that World of Warcraft gives. It brings me back to being... 14, 15 years old again, you know, 15 years ago, um, and playing MMOs for the first time. And I think WoW dropped 2004, 2005, um, and I was already playing things like Anarchy Online, Dark Age of Camelot, Legend of Mir, Neocron, you know, a whole range of Sheeran's Call 2, Ultima Online. I've grown up on MMOs. I was a PC gamer. Like, I'm not a console gamer. I keep stating that. Like, I'm a Destiny gamer, but I'm not a console gamer. Um and Nobody's why, perfect, Gary. Nobody's perfect. And I think that's why WoW tugs at my nostalgia strings. Um, talking about nostalgia, this has been a year of nostalgia, hasn't it, really, for for us? Our next topic is nostalgia marketing. And why are we such suckers for nostalgia? Get that fucking toaster away from us. Look at the thing that he pulls up. <laughs> for those that are in the audio, I think Beastie's trying to peddle this Chinese hunk of shit that he keeps <laughs> keep bringing out. We can't <laughs> But no one cares about that. He keeps showing us. He's made videos on it on his YouTube channel. Imagine a shoebox so... with an NES cartridge sticking out of it. I'm okay with it. I love that thing. But Gary just keeps tearing it he down. He kills it, don't he? Starting with fake Vita and then, what was it, toaster Chinese piece of shit? <laughs> Wait, why are you going to be so evil, Gary? Which just was made immediately in triggers me. It's the, the two styles of plastic on it. They couldn't even source enough red plastic to finish the job. It's just like... It's evil. You're, so, you're fucking mean, okay? <laughs> Look how thick it is. <laughs> it's huge. Look at this. You know it's big when it makes a Vita look like that. It's two uh, Game but... Gears glued together. That's all it is. <laughs> <laughs> two Game Gears with an even worse battery life. If you I mean, for the Audiani <laughs> listeners, Beastly's found something in like a dumpster from like 10 years ago <laughs> with an SNES cartridge stuck in the back and he's claiming it's the next generation of handhelds. We disagree. <laughs> okay, Gary, I'm putting it away. God damn it. <laughs> the room has spoken. Uh, That's the topic of nostalgia. Why, why do we think that we're such suckers for it? This like, isn't, why do we this isn't it just age? limited to gaming, right? This is happening. This happens in all forms of life. It's why, like, when VH1 does a ret, we love the 80s or we love the 70s or, or CNN does, like, a retrospective on the 60s and 70s. This is why this stuff is popular because for people who live through those time periods, a lot of them have very fond memories of that time period, right? Like they were kids at the things. time and you know, the, there's a lot of joy when you're a kid that you look back fondly and remember. And when somebody brings those memories up uh, in the form of basically anything, you know, it could be the music at the time, it could be the video games at the time, it could be the TV at the time. It brings back those memories for you and those memories are often good, right? If they're I remember playing, uh, you know, Super Mario with my brother on the couch and just laughing and having a good time. And we we're so innocent back then. So, you know, when Nintendo brings out Super Mario again, you're like, oh, man, I wonder if playing that again brings back that feeling. Right. Yeah. Um, spoiler, it doesn't. <laughs> Thanks for just letting us all some down of lightly. Up. Some of them hold up, but the games are I still good. But it's not going to bring yeah. back that feeling, right? No, it's it's not. It it a little bit. It does bring bring my mind back to a simpler time. I yeah. mean, like I was very fortunate to have a great childhood. It was awesome. Lots of great memories. Lots of good friends that I played games with and stuff like that. And it it's just only human nature that with age that like you cling on to some of you know 
some of the good memories and stuff you know it, it's nostalgia is a funny feeling man there's nothing like it like when you run into something that you had as a kid like i do a lot of girl do a lot of garage sailing, used to do a lot of flea marketing and stuff for old games. And it's an indescribable feeling when you come across something that you used to have as a, uh, at a younger age and you've got disposable cash now, so you pick it up. And it's just human nature, man, to cling to the past, especially the positive stuff. Especially since so, so much of that stuff that you had back then, you got rid of for whatever reason. Either your parents threw out when you moved away or... You know, maybe you had to sell it to get a new game or a new CD or something like that. You know, a lot of my CDs when I was a kid, I used to buy CDs and then sell the CDs to get new CDs, right? Back in the days where you used to Pusher buy CDs man. and then make a tape with the CD. <laughs> Read that guy at they the mall. We buy my mixtape. Bro, we had, a, we had a store. We had a store, a head shop in our town that you could sell CDs. To. Nice. We had one similar as well. It's very cool. For me, um, I, the one one of the best aspects of, of my youth growing up was video games. It was my escape. Uh, I didn't have the, the best childhood. I, I, I actually had kind of a, a rough childhood growing up. Parents divorced. There's a lot of infighting. A house full of kids. I've got five brothers and one sister. And so it, it was tough. We didn't have a lot. And so whenever we got video games once a year, uh, it was a really special thing. I remember when my mom bought me the Super Scope 6 for Christmas when I was 11. You know, things like that. When I see him out in the, in the wild, it brings me back to a time in my life where things were great when I was a kid because we didn't have that very often. And people, most people don't see someone my age or our age who indulges in this type of shit. I go to a store and I see something that just, it, like you said, Wilson, it's a very unique feeling, nostalgia. It makes you tingle all over and you want to share that with people. You want to bring people who are in the current space into that memory and kind of share it with them and show them what it was like. And so for me, uh, that's what nostalgia is. And I think that it's easy to market it to people. And it could be like Briar said on any aspect of life. If you were there, those were the good old days. Whether you want to admit it or not, pretty much all of your life at this point in the past, you can call it the good old days because you survived it and you became a better person. And so when you see things in the present that remind you of those times, sometimes you want to reach out and grab it and hold on because a lot of people forget who they were and, and, and what created the person that they are today. And, and those past experiences and memories are what cultivated the person you are. And for me, I'll hold on to it because it- Well, the mind, makes the mind tends to block out the painful memories of your past and enhance the, the really good ones, right? It's like a, That's why I only a defense mechanism. <laughs> it's a defense mechanism, right? Yeah. So a lot of your memories of the past, even if you had a painful you know, childhood, there, there's probably a lot of memories that you still have that will give you a sense of nostalgia and like, oh, you know, even though my childhood was really painful, uh, I did, you know, I did really enjoy those comic books, right? That I got once a, I got those comic books once a month and I, you know, they were escape for me. And now every time I see a Spider-Man comic book from that era, you know, it really speaks to me and it really makes me think of the good times, you know, you strong Absolutely, connection to Spider-Man because of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, brother. <laughs> I 100% agree, man. Um, but I guess it's a question that will never be answered. Why is it why is it so easy to market nostalgia? It's really marketing memories, man. You know? Yeah. You, you go back 10, 20 years and market a shirt. You know, someone markets a Nintendo shirt, I feel uh, an affinity towards buying it. Just with a Nintendo icon. I remember that. And it could be anything from a, 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 a late, or earlier uh, point in time. And to me, it'll always be, and the older you get, the more shit you're going to end up buying because one day, today, the stuff we have now, will be nostalgia. Right. So this yeah, conversation yeah, I, I, gets a lot more fucked in 10 years when Wilson and Gary start seeing the the stuff that their kids or their the younger generations start getting marketed to for nostalgia. Yeah. Like when when I Minecraft. see people getting marketed to nostalgia for Xbox <laughs> games and <laughs> PlayStation oh, yeah. 2 games, Remember I'm like, fidget spinners? what? <laughs> <laughs> Remember fidget spinners? Yeah. Remember jams? You remember, oh my God, when you start hearing your favorite radio on the oldie yeah. station, you're like, oh yeah. shit, <laughs> things are going wrong fast well, over that's, here. We've, that's huge. We've got that in the UK. So we've got like BBC radio, which is kind of like, you know, like our national radio, whatever. And it starts off at radio one when you're like, you're cool and you're young. 
And as you get older, you you progress to like Radio 2 and 3 and 4. And the older you get, the higher you go up through the, the ratings as to like where you are. I'm currently at Radio 2, so I'm I'm not quite young, but I'm not quite old there. But You still uh, hold on to it? Or you switch over to Radio 3 every once in a while, right? You're like, no, no, no I'm still no, Radio some, 2. Sometimes. I'm still Radio 2. I go the other way. I, I, I flip back to Radio One and get crunk. That's it. I get lit. So uh, when when Gary's in the car alone, he's on Radio Four. When somebody else gets yeah. in the car, he goes to Radio Two. When the lady gets in the car, it's back to two. Yeah. Let me ask you guys a question. Speaking of nostalgia, who remembers Beanie Babies? Oh yeah, I remember I them. Do. My remember. mom was a uh, certified realtor, and uh, oh. yeah, it was awesome. We used to. My mom would be like, make me and my friends be like, take you guys to McDonald's. We'd all stand in line and order separately so we could get the teeny beanies or whatever when oh, they did the, the small ones. Yeah. yeah, and my mom was a realtor for a sort of – she still is a Thai realtor. I mean, they're still making those things. Um, Wait, yeah. I don't understand. A realtor for beanies? Like, 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 a, like, like, you know, retail store. Like, you know, she sells oh, them. Okay. This is what I'm trying to say. Like, yeah, she wow, – okay. Is there still she a market a, for them? Um, they've kind of moved like, yeah, there still is. It's mostly, um, for lack of a better term, senior citizens that are really into them. But there's this new thing called Webkins. And it's the same thing, except you have a little code on the tag and you can go online and then you can take care of it like an online Tamagotchi or a Gigapet. Oh wow! Oh, so that's the new that's the new hot shit. How the internet changed that's Tamagotchi. That's a genius idea. Whoever thought of that was absolutely it is. brilliant. It, it is. It is brilliant. The yeah, but I mean, thing... for the cost of a Tamagotchi, a Tamagotchi is what, like twenty, thirty dollars. Like you can just remember. buy a hamster at the store for fifteen, and it's the same principle. If you don't feed it, it will die. You yeah. have to clean up its shit. You know, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, but, but it's, it's not real, real stinky shit. shit. <laughs> yeah, it's real tangible <laughs> shit versus digital pixels. Look, I go you into never... Fortnite and I'm chopping down trees and blasting rocks, but I don't want to do it in real life. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's hard work. Yeah. Yeah. If, if there was there's one no thing, mini uh, game where I got to hit the tree in the specific spot. Either. <laughs> <laughs> you can make one. There, uh, but like like we said, I don't really think there is an exact answer as to why you know nostalgia marketing is so successful. I think it's just an exploit that they know will work that that preys on certain generations. I guess, for lack of a better term, preys on certain generations. I, I enjoy it. it. I love all. the feeling. Yeah. I think it preys on all generations, and, and I think it's something that's been going on for decades. I do least. wonder. I wonder how immune the current, like the current crop of kids who are like fifteen. Like I, I'm watching my kids grow up, right, and they don't see advertising at all. Like they just don't get yeah. advertising. So sure, true. they see YouTube videos, but they click skip ad on every video, and they run an ad blocker for about everything. You know, like they just. They don't turn on the TV, so they don't see ads on TV. Like they just don't get advertised to. So I wonder how that's going to influence as they grow up, right? They're so different. I'm sure, every generation goes through this, but they are so different. <clears throat> the way they are growing up, the activities they enjoy, is so foreign to me. I can't wait to see how they develop as young men. You know, wow. like, I, like I can't wait because, like they. They're never being exposed to marketing. What does that do to you? Or, you know, like what has really what what has it done to us as opposed to what does it do to the you or them? Because they're not exposed to it. So they're the control sample for advertising. Yep. It's, a, it's going to be a new form of advertisement. You know, uh, I don't see ads at all. I don't I have cable, but I don't watch it. It made my Internet bill a little bit lower. So I added it unbelievably. But when we went on vacation in the middle of the month, we were at my sister-in-law's house and we had to watch commercials. And I swear, I felt like I was back in 84. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it, that it was still a commercial yeah. like every two minutes. I was like, what? You actually you sit guys, through this? I can't believe it. You guys it. have it rough in the US though. Like you guys have commercials every 10 to 15 minutes during an episode. Like we in the UK, we, we kind of don't tolerate that shit. Plus the American commercials are like some harsh shit. Like whenever I'm in the <laughs> States, I go over there and every episode convinces me to take some sort of like every advert is like you must take this prescription medication. That's it. Listing yep. shit that you've got. Like, are you tired? Are I'm you half awake? convinced that they're are giving people they're giving people diseases. <laughs> like they're like, do you do your legs wiggle when you sleep? You have <laughs> restless leg syndrome. I'm like, shit, my legs do wiggle when I sleep. <laughs> because, because we've got the NHS over here. I gotta here in the talk UK, to like, my doctor. 
Because <laughs> we've got free healthcare, we don't have that shit. People don't me- like marketing medication to us. That's the biggest change that I saw yeah. in your American marketing. Is I'm watching the TV and there's someone trying to sell me this prescription shit to get me hooked on. Like, yeah, only yeah. forty nine ninety nine. We'll give you a free pill case. Like, take this shit. Like, yeah. oh, dude, erectile crazy. dysfunction. How much? How much erectile dysfunction is an actual like physical problem for people? And how much is it, of it is people hearing about it through a commercial being like, that can happen? I've got and then be just being it's a, it's scared pretty, it's going to happen to them, so it does. It's a, it's a pretty real Man, I hope I can not, get it up tonight. It, okay. <laughs> that's not me with my erectile yeah. dysfunction. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. It's, um, but another thing to be said, too, is that an hour-long program is going to it's going to be 20 minutes worth of commercials over here. Yeah, for real. Oh, yeah. You're going to get a 40-minute sure, You get 42 minute minutes. Program. 42 minutes out of an hour is the actual oh, show. On our, terrestri- on our commercial. standard TV, so not cable and stuff, our standard TV, like BBC One, Two, whatever, they have no commercials. Zero. Yeah, but you it's government-funded TV. Yeah, that's that's PBS, yeah. Yeah, but it's got, like, normal shows on it. It's just, like... Yeah, but it's still government-funded TV. Like, you pay yeah, a good. tax to own a TV, yeah, and that right, funds your... Commercial-free. That's it's just exciting. Yeah, it's just funded differently, though. Like you, you still pay for it. You just don't pay for it with the time sitting in You're front of the TV. You pay for it with time at work. Yeah, I suppose so. You don't feel it like it's like fifteen dollars a month for like a TV license. So it's it it's, just, it's just, a it's, different system, though. That's what I'm saying. It's like they don't have to they don't have to fund the 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 content through commercials like they do here because they mm-hmm. tax you for it. That I don't know. It was just culture shock watching American TV. Like, yeah, I bet. You know, you, you guys have like the the title reel commercial, then a bit of the show, then a commercial, and then like mm-hmm. you guys have a commercial, then the credits, and then a commercial. It's like I, I, I don't just, even know anymore like, though because everything I watch is like off of Netflix or on YouTube, YouTube or yeah. like so it's just I, like I don't have cable TV anymore. That, I don't see that. Yeah, I, don't I haven't had it in have ten years. I, yeah, that model of just like constantly barraging you with with commercials when I do go to somebody's house that hasn't has it running like. I'm like, holy shit, this is like unwatchable. Yeah. <laughs> like, how did we deal with this? It's a commercial box nowadays. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. I find son. the best entertainment on TV in, in the States. Sorry, Beast, I'll let you, you crack on no, there. No, but no, whenever no, I've no, come no. over, and I'm probably over in the States maybe four weeks out of every year, the best entertainment you guys have is your news. Your news is fantastic. American news is like the best <laughs> news in the world. Fake it's like news. It's, <laughs> I, I'm not going to talk about any particular stations. Like, I don't care. Just any station that I go on to. You guys have like, like the most attractive news readers I've ever seen. Like it's like Hollywood celebs. Like, okay, that's actually news. something different than the news being good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you, you've got the that. attractiveness of the host. You sure you just didn't go to the Playboy Channel with the weather and you know I, what I mean? They had this. <laughs> I may have. I may. I, I mean, the news reader did get their breasts out halfway through the episode i mean yeah, i'm not sure what it was Fox, man. yeah that was that was that's called the playboy channel <laughs> yeah probably probably was probably it's was. funny anyway, though basically. uh it's something kate and i were talking about my son had mentioned to us uh earlier in the week that his mom had a 200 dollar cable bill and uh she was stressing over it because she doesn't like paying that much for her cable and he told her he said mom why don't you just you know get netflix get a roku box or something like that yeah and she told him, she said, well, there's certain shows I need to be able to watch. And he said, well, well mom, if you just get internet, you can watch those shows. You can get yeah. little subscription plans through the mm-hmm. internet. And she just didn't understand. My mom, she pays about 170 a month for her, di- her digital TV uh, up in Ohio. And she told me that she gets all these hundreds of channels. And I explained to her that, well, you can't watch them all at the same time. Why don't you just get internet, which she has, get rid of the cable and just watch what you want to watch when you want to watch it. And she she still didn't get it. She still didn't understand it. Yeah, and that's I, how I, you get. You've got to try try it. Uh, my mother wasn't getting it for a while either. Like she just she she listened to what I was saying because I've been I, I haven't had a cable box in my house for ten years, and I'd tell her what I was up to, and she'd be like, "Yeah, but you know, what about this? What about that?" I'm like, "It's all there." You just the difference is though is she's somebody who likes to put on a channel and just have and it playing. On. You know what I mean? It's like she'll put on uh, Home and Garden TV or Do It Yourself TV, and she's not necessarily sitting on the couch watching it. But while she's in the, you know, she's doing something in the kitchen, or she's vacuuming, or she's playing with the dog, and it's just kind of on as background noise. Like a like somebody else might have music on. She likes to have home improvement shows on because that's like gotcha. kind of her 
her hobby is like home improvement and real estate kind of stuff. So she really likes having that stuff on and she tunes it out half the time, but sometimes there's somebody on there saying something really, you know, intelligent and she, you know, she picks that information up. So they, you can't gotcha. use Netflix in that way. Kind of, you know, like it doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, Netflix and the Hulu, they don't kind of work that way. You can sort of do it, but it doesn't, it's not the same. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a constant change. I feel like that era of television is actually moving away. It's going away. I think that very soon we'll be at the, the point where a majority of the world is watching television through the internet only. I think yeah. cable and cable service providers are going out the door. I think that they know that. To me, the writing's on the wall. It's been on the wall for a long time. It's a, it's a damn shame because I like trash cable. Like, you know, we've got the same in the UK. Like, I miss Maury. <laughs> Maury and don't do that. That's Dr. the Field. worst it's, fucking TV in, in, in the history. That's Maury delicious. and Jerry Springer does not ever need to be on American t TV. Ever. I'm waiting for the Beastly episode. You know, <laughs> is Beastly the father of this child? I just, I want these episodes. <laughs> that would be so um, much fun to have us all on like a panel on Maury Povich. <laughs> When he says you're Wilson's not throwing fuck. chairs at Gary. Yep. <laughs> Gary yeah, Beasley's got the pregnancy <laughs> test out. He's like, you're the daddy. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best. It's my dream. My dream to be in there. <laughs> oh, Maybe geez. we should do one of those dumb guys. dumb teasers like, pretending to be on like the fucking Maury Puppet show. <laughs> I'm down. Gary's going to be the, the lead actor, though. He's the best actor on the, on the Revolver like crew. Was the cash cash me outside girl? Was she she was Maury? Was she or was uh, she in a different? Yeah, show? she was on Maury. Uh, yeah. No, she was, was Dr. Phil, wasn't she? Doctor, yeah, yeah, Dr. Phil, Dr. Phil, yeah. What Dr. does that just, mean? How about that? <laughs> it's just up, yeah. yeah, it's just a cleaned up Maury. I, I, I like the raw authenticity of Maury. Yeah, I uh, I gotta tell you guys, I want to do more of those promo videos that we were doing before we started the show. They've Got ruined me on YouTube. Picture. I was what? talking about this on DCP the other day. Is that? My motivation to do like normal ass YouTube videos <laughs> is at an all time low. All I want to do is fucking stupid ass DCP promos where, you know, we're all like looking at the camera with dramatic faces going, revolver. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. That's all I want to fucking do. <laughs> They're fun to make. They were fun. Yeah. They were fun it's, to make. It's, it's fun. Yeah, we'll definitely have to do some more. I definitely. think if chat want to see it, they should uh, definitely show the love right now and give us some motivation to, to get crunk and get stupid on the uh yeah. on the promos you guys let us know what you'd like to see us do as far as promo videos or funny quirks and ideas at revolver gamescast at gmail.com if you guys mm. have any questions or comments please send an email let us know what you guys think anything referring to today's show or topics please send us an email revolver gamescast at gmail.com i mean before we go into the last topic funny behind the scenes story for you guys the um the revolver teaser too which you may or may not have seen um, which was a collab between Briar and myself, me telling a story about the rabbit yes, who was the, uh, the greatest shooter in the West and uh, Briar falling asleep playing the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> he sure was asleep. That um, funny behind the scenes story, I was filming that in a, um, a bit of private land near me. Um, and the point when I'm frantically looking into the camera wearing a child's cardboard fucking hat <laughs> and a Pokemon shirt loading my stuff in, talking about the rabbit and running away, happened to be a point when two relatively innocent, quite elderly looking people walking their dog just happened to be walking past that part of the field <laughs> and looked at me as if I was going to rob them. Like the, the faces that they pulled, they were just trying to like, you know, find out where their wallet was, where their phone was, trying to look <laughs> safe and innocent. I like the Never stuff trust were... a man with a I Jigglypuff like the on his shirt. Were... <laughs> yeah, agreed with, with various Pokemon Jigglypuff on their shirt. I like the stuff you're putting into the bag. I think I heard a bag of crisps. We call them chips over here. I don't know what you guys call them. Um, potato. But like a bag of pota potato chips. Potato uh, chips. There was yeah, definitely yeah. some sort of snack item that was going into your bag, so I'll give you props for that. There was a pink bandana. There was a Hawaiian shirt. Uh, there was a bag of snacks. There was some strawberry laces. Yeah, it was quite yeah. an assortment, actually. At, yeah. at least you, you had your priorities straight. You know, yeah. the rabbit was coming. You had to get the most important shit in your house. <laughs> that, fucking, that cardboard cutout over your head takes years <laughs> off, man. You looked like you were 12 all over again with that thing. Like, you just got done with your birthday party. I respect oh. the determination of him. Uh, you know, he gave his whole his whole spirit to the acting job. You know, he got these two <laughs> ladies walking towards him. He didn't waver. He didn't look away from the camera. He looked frantic. He looked as afraid as they looked. So, I mean, you did, you I was did in character. I can't break character. I'm a right. method actor. You know, I'd worked hard to get into character. I'd spent 10 minutes getting myself into the mode. No, I had to, I had to roll with it. 
<laughs> I can just see Gary sitting out in the field crying, <laughs> just getting himself there. The rabbit's oh, coming. Dang. The rabbit's coming. <laughs> so, do you think it's time to transition onto our last topic of the day? Oh, I think so. I, I think it is. So, Jin Jin, thank you very much, Hugo. We're onto our last shot. Right. Mm. Gaming branded products. What do we think about Ultra Elite MLG Pro? RGB filled gaming branded products. So the market is becoming filled with gaming products. Now this can be anything, gaming chairs, gaming headphones, you know, things like DX racers, Astro RGB keyboards. I actually saw on eBay, you can get something called a gaming lamp, right? And this gaming lamp <laughs> is a rainbow ball that shoots RGB colors onto the wall around you oh. to make it more I want it. You, <laughs> I see, know, this, I want you that. see this tie dye back here? It's just not doing it for me anymore. I need RGB lighting assortment. I want I mean, it. You could, you I actually do have RGB have lighting in my room. Like oh that my is, I have few lights that you can change the color of with an app on your phone, and it literally, like you can you can change it. You know, they turn blue when it rains. Uh, they used to turn red when Game of Thrones was about to come on because I knew that my wife was about to come get me for Game of Thrones. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> um, they I turn, remember. They, they get a little bit more yellow uh, later in the night, and they turn – the one in my bedroom, actually, it starts very dim and then gets bright as, like, day uh, by 8 o'clock in the morning to, like, kind of wake me up at, like, a normal time without – That's so cool. Yeah, so it's actually really cool. But th that's – I don't think what Gary's talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's a little, a little but it's still Sorry. cool, Briar. <laughs> no, so it's it's more just like gaming things. What do we think? Do we think it's gone too far now? Do we think that gaming is just a term that's put on as a marketing term now, more so than actually being fit for purpose? So, I, I mean, I'm dragging DX Racer through the mud here, by the way. Not a sponsor, obviously, probably never going to be now. But <laughs> DX Racer, um, <laughs> it's a fucking chair. How how much more can you get? It's a I, I've got a chair. dream of going to the like the dump or not the dump, but like the the pound or where where do they put in cars? I don't even know. Um, the, not the pound. Uh, that's where they bring dogs. The scrapyard. <laughs> scrapyard. Junkyard, yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> I got a dream of going to the scrapyard and buying like a Mercedes chair and mounting it on wheels so that like that would be my chair for gaming. It was like a like a you know a chair like a like a seat from a car. You know. Right. Yeah. It'd be a clever play on like the gaming racing chairs, you know. Yeah, it's funnier in my head than apparently when I say it I out loud. My, <laughs> I wish my uh, it certainly was. <laughs> wish my neighbor would take his car that he's had sitting out to the pound for crying out loud. Yeah, it's right. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, bring it to the humane society. Yeah. This, this is this is what I think about it, Gary. Um, video games and video game media are they make more money in gaming than we do in films. It, it's the number one money making. I think uh, as far as media goes, and entertainment goes, the number one uh, slot in the world is, is video gaming. And y if you look at every other aspect of uh, entertainment, music and film, everything is marketed. You know, if you got a good yeah. movie out, there's a hundred toys or a thousand toys. Music, it's the same way. You see t-shirts and all kinds of marketing products and video games, it, they just kind of open up the cauldron. There's so many different things that can be mar marketed around video games, characters, stories, places. And it's, you know, at the end of the day, these companies, these businesses that market these products, they want to make money. And they know that video gaming is the number one moneymaker in the world. It all makes sense to me. And I know that sometimes it can become, you know, over and encumbering when you think world. that everything out in the it world is pointed at you and asking you for money. But that's how capitalism works. And uh, I think that's the reason it's, it's still su successful and sustaining success all these years. The thing is, right, I, when I was a kid, is they didn't actually market anything to gamers. You you went out and you bought a NES or a SNES, and that was it, right? Like maybe you could get, uh, you know, accessories from uh, Sears or from <laughs> Bradley's or like there there were some accessories, but they were mainly just made by NES or Nintendo or Sega. Now is like you can get a gaming mouse, and it is significantly changed for gaming you can get a gaming keyboard that is significantly different for ga even a motherboard or you can get you know chairs i know it's funny that you know they have gaming chairs but you know they're better than sitting on a couch if you're yes. playing for long periods of time because they're you know they're supporting better posture they usually have better support 
Um, there's, I mean, what else is there? There's gaming monitors are different for gamers than a specific, like a regular monitor would be. So yeah, there's a lot of shit out there that says, you know, this is, this is for gamers. This improves, this gel improves your grip on the controller. These are gaming glasses that, you know, they, you know, there's, there's shit out there, but there's also really good stuff that is, it has been developed with gaming in mind and it does work. You know, it is, it is better for a gamer than other things. I hear you on that. I mean, like, I definitely think there's things like monitors with higher refresh rates. Definitely. If there's a functional benefit to it being a gamer's thing, but you mentioned chairs, mm-hmm. you know, you can get like a design by humans or something that's not a gaming chair, just a good supportive chair. It's yeah. definitely going to be better. Astros, we've mentioned them before. I think they're a good headset, definitely, but mm-hmm. they're not. I mean, the headset that I've got on at the moment, the Bayer Dynamics. So you gotta it, you gotta look at Astros w- when they came out too, because it was a completely different headphone market when Astros first hit the scene. Beats wasn't even a fucking thing. You know, high end headphones were not something that was being sold in Best Buy or the local shop down the street. There was earbuds and there was off brand earbuds. <laughs> you know, yeah. so right. and yeah. all of a sudden, yeah. a couple of companies came out with. I think it was Triton and Astros came out with high end gaming headphones. They're not great for uh, listening to music. You're better off buying something like you got the Buyer Dynamics, or you're better off getting you know a higher class of or of audio, an audiophile specific set of headphones if that's your goal. But for gaming, they offered a lot of cool features, like they would turn up the treble really high so you could hear footsteps in Call of Duty really well. You know, like they are gaming, they were gaming specific and they were better than the shitty fucking headphones that came with your Xbox 360 or your, or your, well, I don't even think the Sony PlayStation 3 came with headphones. Yeah, No, it didn't. Not that I remember. Astros. In my opinion, Astro and Triton changed the game for headphones in the gaming world. And while the world has changed and those, you know, they might not, they might not look as, you know, uh, amazing as they did back then. Yeah. They really changed the game. Yeah. I think they set the market, uh, like a market standard to begin, uh, to begin with, um, Turtle Beach too, I think is it. Yeah. Turtle Beach was a huge one. Um, before I used like nice good headphones um back in the call of duty modern warfare days my buddy was all about the turtle beaches being able to hear people what's that sound boring was a thing yes it was you huge had a that's why they had a significant to... advantage yeah they had to make a perk that made you make less noise eventually you know what i mean for the game that's how big of a deal it was but like briar touched on there's a lot of crap out there that i think a lot of people see through um Personally, I'm not a fan of like the gaming glasses, but hey, you know, there is a thing called a placebo effect. If you really think it's helping you out, maybe it is. You know, if, if you're into that, that's totally cool. You know, they tried the whole, what was it, the whole gamer fuel or whatever, you know, like with the, yeah. uh, you know, and then there was uh, Mountain Mountain Dew did a, did a play on that. And um, it, like I bought it, it was cool. Like I think I bought it for like, I bought like a Halo 3 Master Chief one or something and kept it. But if you're going to be spending, a lot of time in a chair, on a keyboard, on a mouse, or something like that. I do feel that it is important to invest in something that is specifically designed for gaming. Um, my keyboard is a little outdated. Uh, the Logi- Logitech G510. Um, it's got 18 macro keys on the side. You know, obviously this is a you know MMO RPG style keyboard with all those macro keys, but it made playing the game much easier star wars the old republic is what i bought it for it made the, playing the game much easier much more enjoyable i had to look down at my keyboard less and it actually the ergonomics of my hand it felt a lot better um to just reach over there and hit those those macro keys that i um have 18 of and i think like some of the stuff is a ploy you know like kind of to get people just to buy stuff they slap the the gaming edition on it but ultimately i think there's a reason why Things are specifically designed for gaming because they know that people yeah. spend uh, a large amount of time at those things. And they need to be comfortable. And some of this stuff too, Wilson is. I'm starting to come around on like those glasses, right? Is those glasses came out how many years ago? Five, six, seven years ago. Well, and well, basically, yeah. they're yellow glasses. tinted glasses, right? Mm-hmm. I, I can't remember the name of them. 
Um, but they're yellow tinted glasses marketed toward gamers. And I thought, well, that's kind of, what? I don't get that. And then all of a sudden, Apple starts talking, well, now our new displays dim more yellow as the night goes on to be less stressful on your eyes. And and Windows all of a sudden has this kind of night mode where it dims everything toward yellow to be easier on the eyes. And all the new monitors are coming with these blue light filters to be easier on the eyes. And I'm like, God, motherfucker, these, these guys selling these glasses. <laughs> I was just going to work full of shit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can definitely feel it after staring at my monitor all day. You know, you can definitely I mean, feel the strain. The point wasn't so much an attack on, on functional hardware. I mean, like sweeping... Uh, in chat, just spoke about his Razer Naga MMO, and uh, again, I used a, a Naga mouse, an MMO mouse, um, for the buttons when it was out. I think there's certain things do function well in gaming. I think it's more the gaming as a brand when when something is just a cheap product and they yeah. make it look extreme. You know, they put fucking RGBs on it, or they make the plastic really flared and garish and call it a gaming thing. You see it most in PC gaming cases. Yeah, I don't so love Chinese that. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Chinese and Taiwanese manufacturers will call it a gaming case. And they'll make the thing huge with exhaust fans everywhere, and it just looks awful. I don't know. I just I feel like is the market in a place now where people, people are looking back to more authenticity uh, in their brand, and they want something that's functional more than flashy. I, you know, like I the headphones it. that I've gone for, et cetera. Gary, I see it like literally there's a divide in my office. This side is all PC gaming stuff, and this side is all Apple stuff, and all the Apple stuff is white and metal mm. and subdued and industrial designed and very beautiful, and all the gaming stuff is like garish and RGB'd out up the ass and yellow and fucking, like you say, like flares all over the place. And I, I was saying on Twitter, the like this was probably almost a year ago, I'm like, why doesn't anybody make a gaming mouse that doesn't look like a kid's toy. Like, why can't yeah. somebody just make a gaming mouse that looks like it was built for an adult? Because I don't need it to have, you know, flashy yellow paint. I don't need to have naked women on the packaging and, and I do. you know, garish. No, I disagree. Disagree. <laughs> and, you know, garish lights all over the place. I don't really give a shit about that. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with something that looks like very well industrial designed and, like, is aesthetically pleasing sitting on a desk that is neat and clean and tidy. Like to me, that's, that's much more attractive, but nobody makes that shit. Cause you know, they're selling to testosterone fueled, uh, adolescents. adolescents. That, yeah. That want everything to look like a rat, rat racer from 1960s cartoons. I think it's all the, and also the attention span of the people they're trying to market. You know what I mean? It's easier yeah. to catch your audience, the younger audience's attention. If it's boom, lights and explosions yeah, cool, and, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if my 12-year-old self, like, that would have been the mouse for me with lasers and disco balls and all oh, this stuff. Sure. Like, yeah, yeah, that would have been. But, like, you know, you get a little older and you want function over form. I mean, keyboard RGB lighting has to be the single most redundant invention that's ever happened. I mean, all my keyboards have RGB lighting mm -hmm. and none of them have it enabled. Like, n none of the keyboards I've had I, have ever I had I like it RGB because I am a... I, I look at my keyboard a lot uh, oh, okay. because I'm not a touch typist. Uh, so when it's dark in my office, when I don't have like these blazing fucking lights staring down at me, <laughs> like I don't, I don't mind being able to just like look down, like where the fuck is the function key on this keyboard? I don't okay, know. Okay, but what you're talking about illuminated versus RGB. So what I'm yeah. talking about is like you hit it and it's spiral fucking rainbow, seven colors off the mm -hmm. side of it, wherever you did like that sort of features. Like, why does that make it more gaming? He's doing it right now. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's doing, doing it right it. now. The so dead, here we, so we go. Can't see it, but I here imagine that Brian's frantically, you know, touching keys and, and grinning to himself. But I don't know. I, I just feel like, is it time for us as gamers to start looking at the functionality of products? So I gave my headset as an example. Microphones, the fact that Turtle Beach is doing a stream mic, Razer do a microphone, like a gaming microphone, etc. They're just functional products, and you can get better alternatives elsewhere. I mean, like scuffs that. have got some relevance to them because of the paddles, but I'm just talking about where there's a direct comparable. You know, if you've got a microphone or yeah. a chair, you know, they're just, they do a purpose. There's not, this chair doesn't have extra frames in it. This is a chair. If I get a supportive <laughs> chair that's ergonomic. But does it have good lumbar support? That's the first thing you got to look and do for me. Uh, I office. did concrete for nine, I did concrete for like nine years. I got to have some sort of lower back support on mine. And I'll tell you right now, Office Max has some awesome chairs, and they're all they have always have way too many 
and just pay attention every week. And there's always 50% off chairs that would normally cost, you know, 300 bucks, 400 bucks, you know, let, let and, me, let me quickly tell you guys why I think, uh, we we've come into this conundrum of gaming peripherals and gaming, uh, products looking, you know, with lightning bolts coming from them. And like you said, disco balls, this is the first time this has ever happened. And, and sometimes it's hard for uh, companies that make products to understand that their demographic is getting older. Before us, there weren't adult gamers before us. No. We're the first, we are the first generation of adult gamers, but to companies, we're like superheroes because superheroes never get old. Gamers uh, have all... money now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. To, to companies that make these products, their their core audience is still kids. We were kids. We got a little bit older. By the time we all hit 20 years old, they were marketing to us. The next year, they were marketing to 20-year-olds. Five years later, they were marketing to 20-year-olds. And now look at us at the age we are now. They're still marketing to the, this younger demographic. And well, they the haven't games, really... Re the games have moved on. The games have gotten more mature, but the accessory market hasn't really caught on. I, I, I think that it's going to take a bold initiative for, for one of these companies that makes these types of devices to understand that there are 45-year-olds 40, who enjoy gaming and, and they enjoy PC gaming or console gaming who like to have... Uh, an adult version of some of these peripherals, something that doesn't stand out in your room. I mean, if you have a nice living room setup, you don't want a controller sitting on a table or, or yeah. a peripheral that looks like, you know, a rainbow. You want something that's classy and, and something that's tasteful. And that could be, you know, a benefit to maybe a classic entertainment center versus something that stands out like a sore thumb. So I think Even one the of these consoles days, have gotten better at this, right? It's like, yeah, the, the, yeah. You, the you look at the PlayStation 3 or the Xbox 360 or the PlayStation 4. Yeah. You know, they you like compare toys. those to like. Well, to me, they look a lot better than we. If you look back at like the old uh, Genesis and NES and yeah. even the PlayStation One, that you know these those things look like toys to me. Toys. Whereas yeah. like the the PlayStation Three or the Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty, you know they they still you know they don't fit in with high end stereo equipment by any means, but like they they don't stand they out as much as like an NES would. The Xbox yeah, I, One S is a beautiful looking oh, machine. It is. I it is absolutely how nice it looks. The, yeah, the One S is a perfect design, much better than the PlayStation cosmetically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, Kate and I, we went and bought a, a new lawnmower because my son absolutely broke my old one. Mm -hmm. And uh, while we were out, she saw the Xbox One S, and she was that was her first time physically seeing one. She was like spellbound. She said, "I yeah. gotta have this one. This is so attractive. It looks. It's so small." She just stared at it for about five minutes and. You know, I think it's something we're, we're going to end up getting, especially for PUBG. But that is to well, be the, the Xbox, Xbox One X is, like, coming right out. Are you going to buy an Xbox One S now? Well, if if the X is coming out, I'll probably end up grabbing it for myself. And if you get an <laughs> X and don't buy a desktop PC, I don't know what we're going to do. I was just going to say, is this cutting into the PC desktop fund that you got? Yeah, we got to talk here, Beastly. We're, approved. I think we're so we might have to. You guys uh, aren't going to kill my fucking dreams here, okay? <laughs> we <laughs> might have to. I was a console to. gamer first, God damn it! I'll smash this Vita, Gary. Keep talking that shit. I'll, you better put shut the up. Vita down. Straight off the show. I'll, I'll put the Vita down. <laughs> Sir, put the Vita down. There you go. Like, we were You're promised. Go. We were promised it. Beastly on PC. We were promised this Beastly. You will have Beastly, beastly on PC. I'll send you all the pictures, and you can look at me at um, 1080p. <laughs> beastly on PC. Uh, but the Xbox One X looks – well, it looks a little bit better to me than the Xbox One S. But, like, I'm looking at the, the PS4 Pro, the, even the the original Xbox One. They look great in the Entertainment Center. They just have kind of a classic look, and they do fit in with the high-end uh, stereo equipment now. They actually have, have nailed it, in my opinion. To me, the Xbox 360 kind of looked toyish. The PS3 did as well a little bit. But I love back, the, the original Xbox 360 with that inhale design. I thought that was a really nice design. I didn't it, like the. I guess it um, aged. It aged, but it, it looked yeah. really cool. Had a good look. Had a horrible function. I had like seven of those. Yeah, I'm with you, Wilson. I I went. Through you you mean the ring ring of that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah they look. They look sexy. They looked like. I remember when I first um, first saw one. Um, my cousin uh, Conman brought one over, and I was like, "This thing looks awesome." You know, you press yeah. the button, and it goes around it like that, and I instantly wanted one. Like you're saying, it was a step up from. I always thought the Sega Genesis looked really cool, even though I was a Nintendo fanboy. The Genesis always looked something like out of like Mad Max and the Thunderdome compared yeah. to the rest. Night runner, um, night runner, yeah. yeah, and then you got like the GameCube. It's like it's got a handle on it. Like, is this a lunchbox? I think it was yeah. designed to look like a toy. Like, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah it looks like yeah, a I don't know. Lego I just think set. Anyone that doesn't design a piece of hardware, especially like gaming hardware that has a disc feeder in it, that isn't just a fucking square box, like a rectangular box, is just doing it wrong. You know, the, I don't even like the PlayStation 4, the way oh, they've done that. Oh, it drives weird me nuts. With the one. fucking... I hate the back of it, how it it's yeah. angled away from you, so you cannot see the plugs. If you're looking over it, you can't see yeah, the fucking that, plugs. That. It should be the opposite you way. You motherfuckers! The one S nailed it because it's a square box, just nice and clear, square <laughs> edges, perfectly slots into any cabinet, perfect. Speaking Dumb. of slotting into any uh, the perfect spot, Briar, the PlayStation 4 and the Pro, you got to treat it like sex, man. You just got to reach back. And then when you finally feel it go in, you found the spot. Look, I mean, look, I because of what I do, I am constantly fucking with cables, right? I am constantly doing it. The other day, I for a video I was doing, uh, comparing the beta of Destiny 2 on the PS4 and the PS4 Pro, like graphically, I had both of the PlayStations sitting next to each other. And I, like, I, <laughs> you cannot fucking see behind those things. It's all black back there. You yeah. can't fucking see a thing. <laughs> It, the PlayStation 4 Pro, if you want to make a pro console, put the fucking connectors on the front, motherfuckers. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, yeah. If you want to light something up, light up those ports, man. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. For, for man. All, like, make it functional and, you know, have some form to it. Yeah. Right. For a man who professes the benefits of a Mac here, I spent $2,500 on my fiance's iMac. Yeah. Where do they put all the ports on that bitch? Yeah, there's only two ports on it, though, so you know where they are. <laughs> Suck at the back of it to turn the thing on. You got to give it a reach around, like to try to fucking turn. You the never thing have on. to turn. You never have to hit that button though. Like you never. Have, you never have you to reboot have a Mac. To you don't have to cuddle with it afterwards though. Yeah, oh, I'm true. doing some broke back mountain shit to turn on the fucking. Someday Mac we're gonna get I'm the trying. Mac versus PC argument on this show. I mean, Briar well, made a very good point about like fiddling for and you know the being a content creator, a Twitch streamer, and just all around you know tech advocate you know he's constantly having to fiddle with stuff you should see him just trying to get discord working earlier today <laughs> welcome to the world guys these guys though every time this show starts they hear me and they see me like go through the frustration of okay what's not gonna freaking work today man is it gonna be discord is it gonna be skype is it gonna be my webcam is it is it just gonna be twitch like who freaking knows but obs I Don't forget it's... obs bro yeah i mean i remember i've had to hang up on you guys 50 times, you know, like, just like, nope, not working. Click. I don't even tell you anymore that yeah, I'm about to hang up. I just, boop, I'm gone. <laughs> it's because it feels good to just hang up. That's it. That's it. Well, little known, Beastie has to wrap the intro live every single week. Yes. We don't actually have it recorded. He just freestyles straight yeah. off the cuff. Yeah. yeah. Straight fire. Bust a rhyme for you. Thank you guys so much for joining us today for Revolver Live, episode two. Uh, we look forward to being back next week, same time, same place. Uh, the things that I'd like to do real quick is let you guys know what's going on with my channel. And, of course, I'll let the other guys pimp out what they're going to be doing. First things first, I'd like to thank the Fallen Legion team for sending me a code for Fallen Legion on PS4 and PS Vita for a, a, a review copy. I'm going to try to get that played and get it out to you. Also, I'm going to be doing the very first episode of uh, um, Horrorcraft, my new Minecraft yes. series this week. Yes, Gary. Yo, I'm everybody else on stuff. this call got a free preview of that, and you took the video down before I could see it. No, it's up. I, I oh, it's up? the video it's up live. It's on, my, oh, okay. it's on my YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, I had to change it a little bit, but that's going to be, uh, I think, going to take up a majority of my time on YouTube in the, in the near future. I'm really excited about it. And, uh, Briar, what are you going to be doing this week? Uh, well, uh, first up, I'm going to be playing a little PUBG with Pope Bear uh, nine minutes ago, so oh. that's going to be fun. Uh, nine actually, minutes ago? Yeah, nine minutes ago. <laughs> if, uh, I don't know. I don't know if anybody is up for that, but we're gonna need to fill out a team. So if, if uh, uh, Wilson or Beasley or Gary, if you are up for a little bit of PUBG after this, uh, we're gonna be doing um, that. On you guys, you guys got room for a token? Yeah. On Tuesday, we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to be playing Fortnite as a group, which I think is gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll get into that. We're gonna try and do that as as commonly as we can every Tuesday. To do uh, revolver plays, I think uh, that'll be a lot of fun going forward into the future. Um, obviously, there's going to be Destiny news on the YouTube channel. Uh, I actually, Iron Banner is coming up, and this is going to be the last Iron Banner of Destiny. 
So I'm thinking I'm gonna try and get in there and play with some viewers. Uh, the last Iron Banner, because I don't even know if there's gonna be an Iron Banner in Destiny it's crazy. Two. Crazy. So let's all get frustrated together one last time. Do some Iron Banner together. <laughs> it's control. It's gonna be just like, just like the old days, except with more grenades. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's all I could think of that I'm doing this week. Wilson, you got anything to pimp? I heard you were streaming, man. Uh, yeah, I fired up the old stream. Uh, it's been a few months. I used to stream a lot, and it kind of started to um, become obsessive, so I took a step back, and I fired it up last night and did some PUBG and had a great time. So if you guys want to come check me out, check me out at Wilson309 on Twitch. Um, Hit that follow button right now so you don't miss it later. <laughs> Turn on those notifications, because he'll fucking stream. You won't even tell he, he's streaming. He'll just do it. You better have those notifications live, otherwise you're going to miss it. Can it's true. Um, he's a shitty friend who doesn't tell you when he's going live. He just goes live. You can take those comments any way you want. I'm just saying hit that follow button. There you go. As far as YouTube goes, uh, not really any plans for YouTube. Um, you know, that could change. Uh, when Destiny 2 comes out, definitely expect some montages to be posted up there. Uh, same thing, Wilson309 on YouTube. And if you want to send me some feedback or shoot the shit on Twitter, you can find me at Ryu Wilson. That's R Y U Wilson on Twitter. What about you, Gary? So I've had a fun week, actually. This week I've decided that I'm going to make the jump into streaming. Uh, I'm going to become a streamer. So I guess it's probably a good time to announce it, actually. We, as a show, um, have actually set up a Twitch channel. We have a whole zero followers, so it's a, it's a big channel right now. Yeah. Um, what we're, it's huge. <laughs> massive. Massive. What we're planning to do is give you guys a bit more content um, between the week. So during the weekends, obviously you've got this on Sunday to look forward to, but if you want to catch us as a group streaming especially tuesday nights other nights we're going to kind of have a, a rotating seat where we can all get behind it and, and play some games be it console be it pc etc so one of these hosts here uh, you'll see us on the channel supporting so i've actually built myself a second pc dedicated to streaming uh, so i can give you guys some some quality um visuals. Oh, yeah right <laughs> You sick. You guys, you ain't see me. I'm just going to be on World of Warcraft all day. They're going to be so you, bored you of it. They're going to be begging me to get off the stream. It's going to be like 12 hour days of WoW that they're going to have to watch. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've got plans to um, stream under the Revolver Live tag um, to help give you guys some some midweek content. Um, aside from that, you can catch me basically shit posting um, and and baiting people on uh, Twitter. Uh, it's at Gary Diaz 86 underscore BT. Uh, the BT stands for Big Thuggin, as I tell them every week. Um, or Blue Tomato. I'm not quite sure yet which one we're going to go for. <laughs> one on the of mood. the two. One of the two. Um, but yeah, catch me on either two. Uh, as I said, if you if you got anything to do, or hit us on revolvergamescast at gmail.com uh, if you've got more long-form email to do. Last thing I do want to pimp out as well, because I've been hogging this uh, limelight, so I might as well go out with it. Uh, we will be on iTunes this week, and we will also be on Google Play. So um, we've got a main site on Podbean, which feeds through to all the Android sources, and I've seen to it that we'll be on iTunes this week. So if you want a better quality uh, audio version, you can catch us there. Uh, I would say watch the YouTube version where you can see Briar sternly staring at the camera, as he has been for the past the 90 minutes. Like, with his <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure he's just taken his pants off, and that was the, the whole point he's of freezing the He's completely nude now. He's free. <laughs> yes. I'm actually in the toilet as we speak. That's what I was going to say. That was a toilet face. That <laughs> yeah. was a toilet face. I just For brought sure. the green screen into the toilet. I'm a much happier person now. Yeah, you talk about gaming chairs. You need to get the DX Racer Toilet Edition. Right? The key was, <laughs> you know, comfort. it really... It was a huge step up when I got the cushion pad for the toilet seat as opposed to that hard ceramic. Yeah. And right <laughs> now they actually up. got a they got a deal going on that you get a free bedpan with the <laughs> for when you leave. No Never leave home leave. without it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean feedback is is always welcome uh, talking about the uh, the Gmail. I mean last week we had some really quality emails. We didn't ask for nudes. Uh, the only person we got any nudes from was Beastly. It didn't take us long to identify the uh, the source of that trouser snake. But if anyone else wants to to send so us anything, proud. again, <laughs> art, pictures, um, videos, anything that you want to send us, we'll be more than happy to have on revolvergamescast at gmail dot com. So also, please do send uh, us something. If you guys have any topics you'd like us to cover, we actually have a kitty of topics that we haven't used. And if you'd like us to address something gaming related, you can write it out, maybe a short little synopsis of your thoughts on anything in gaming and send it to revolvergamescast at gmail.com. And hopefully we'll have you on the show. 
Not really. Are we done? Is that the end of the show? I'll, I'll tell you what, Briar. End it okay. once you move. Why don't you move and then... And I've been then moving we... the whole time. The, you guys can't see me moving, but the same. audience has been seeing me move the whole time. Really? End it with a little revolution, you know? A little Are you revolver. T- I, I think, <laughs> revolver. I think the fidget spinner somehow messed up the equilibrium. That my computer started, and then all of a sudden my screen started spinning all around. I didn't know what was going on. Briar's been sitting still for the last two hours. I'm just, I'm like, a, I'm one of those statues you see in the park. <laughs> not a statue. Yeah. It's a guy dressed up Spray as paint one. Him silver. Exactly. It's exactly. I mean, maybe we'll have a little message for chat to end it. I mean, it's been a long show this time. We've gone over two hours. We've got people who are still in here talking. And if you have made it this far, we want to say from the bottom of our hearts, all of us here, what are you doing with your lives? Why are you still here? Go home. Do something else with your time. Really. That's not two nice, hours. scary. I thought he was That's going in a nice. different direction. I thought he was. <laughs> Don't be an asshole, Gary. How about a dick joke? Right? They've been waiting for two hours for a good dick joke, and you just literally slapped him across the face. Well, could, mine could has been be on the, the floor of the whole show. <laughs> 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 no, seriously, though, thank you guys very much for hanging yeah. out. We do appreciate you guys. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. We love you guys. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. Revolver Live, baby, episode three, coming next Sunday. You better be ready. That's right. We out. Peace.